to one of the most spectacular coastlines in the world, the Great Ocean Road. Some of which we'll get to enjoy today as the peloton makes its way through towards Bells Beach and then back into Geelong for the finish. Bowenheads and Torquay, they'll also be visited. This is Matthew Keenan with you, joined by Phil Liggett. And Phil, the fourth edition of this race, if it is on par with the previous three, we're in for a spectacular day. We are, Matt. The weather is beautiful right now. Perhaps the strong riders would like a little bit more wind, but I've never known it not be windy out on the far side of the course, so I'm sure it will be. Um, I think that we've got 87 of the top women here and some of the best in the world. This has become the traditional season opener now. This is Team Packet Gardens, which has been the host for the team presentation over the past hour or so, where the riders have been milling around, signing on, the anticipation is building. This is Kidinia Park, the home of the Great Geelong Football Club, which has been one of the most successful teams in the Australian Football League, particularly for the past 10 years. Current temperature is 25 degrees. It's expected to rise to 30, so it's hot, but it's not blistering. No, a bit humid, though, and the riders won't be too pleased with it being humid, but hey... Uh, we'll take what comes at them. The wind is swinging all the time. It was south south, now it's southeast, and uh, it's gentle. But I can't believe it won't be windy out on the 13th mile straight. That will be one of the most interesting points to see what sort of a role the wind does play, because in the previous three editions of this race, it has been a major factor. The Yacht Club here in the heart of Geelong as well, it's been busy over the past few days. It's been hosting one of its sailing events. As we head down towards the Barwon River, we might get a chance to take a look at some of the people out there rowing. It's famous as well for its head of the river rowing regatta. Plus, we'll get a chance to take a look at Bells Beach. This is the sign of this is the first ever winner of the race, Rachel Nayland, riding today for the quarter Mentha Real Estate Australian national team. Yeah, and she's always finished in the top three, first, second, or third. So she's got a big reputation in this fourth edition of the event. Young New Zealand team signing in, part of the under 23 squad, some of them going to the Commonwealth Games here in Brisbane in the month of April. Uh, the Ali Cipollini squad signing in as well. They've got Chloe Hoskin on the squad and a possible winner. She's been amongst the places last year. She finished fourth. This is Peter Mullins, who's signing on, a former Australian national champion. One of the big favourites for the race is the defending champion, the world number one, Anna Mick Van Vluten. It's a long time, Matt, since I've seen Carayo Bay quite as calm as this for a bike race, but it's uh, very gentle out there at the moment. The yachtsman won't be happy at all. No, it's ideal conditions, though, for the people that participated in the Swiss People's Ride this morning, where we had more than 3,500 people out there. Cadell Evans was amongst them. So, too, was one Antonio Fletcher. This is down on the start line. The riders are still some seven minutes away from getting started. Some nervous anticipation for some. And for Shannon Molsey, what an opportunity to wear the colours as the Australian national champion. Yes, she's right in the front of our camera here. Shannon took the title in Ballarat and Bunning Young, not far away from where we're talking, about 80 kilometres away. And she took it well. She beat the girls, she deserved it, she'd worked hard for it. She was not a surprise at all. And because of it, she's now going to the Commonwealth Games and maybe among the favourites today as well. Number 31, Chloe Hoskin, you saw just making her way towards the start line. She's been a top 10 finisher here the past few years and is a contender today. The course itself, there's been a few minor changes for 2018. As we see the former world champion, Georgia Bronzini, speaking to the Australian champion. Starting in Geelong, it makes its way neutral section through the gardens. Once it turns blue, the race is on. Heading down towards Bowen Heads, the home of Cadell Evans, along 13th Beach, where we expect some wind to blow, into Torquay, and then it's the first of the intermediate sprints, Bells Beach, the first of the Queen of the Mountains points, and along Forest Road, where the wind again will either play a part, or if it's still, it will be relatively neutral. They turn here onto Chalamba Crescent, the steepest climb of the course, and a chance for the climbers to launch their attack, and then the flattish run through towards the finish line. The finish line itself, that's been slightly changed from previous years. It's a little bit closer towards the heart of Geelong. Amanda Spratt lining up with the glasses on, the earpiece in, former winner of this race, as we're joined by former world champion on the track, former Australian road champion, Kate Bates. Kate, the course, a few changes, but... I'm not sure that it's going to have a significant impact on the complexion of the race. It offers something still for everyone. 
I think the biggest impact we might see out there is actually that the sprinters may be a little bit more nervous. What it's done adding that Chalambra Crescent climb is taken away some recovery for the sprinters and it gives a breakaway or a climber rider who goes over the top of that a little bit more chance of surviving. And they're putting the three former winners right on the start line at the front of the peloton. This is Annemiek van Vluten, who looks so relaxed. Last year, she ended the season as the world's number one ranked cyclist, chatting there to the Italian Giorgio Bronzini, a dual world champion. The Cordament, the real estate colours, that's Rachel Nalen. Career changing win for her when it first happened in 2015. And she's gone on to represent Australia at the Olympic Games and be a tremendously important part of our national team. Shannon Molseed, it is such an honour. It's hard to even describe what an honour it is to ride up in a field of this calibre with the green and gold jersey on. And she's running for a new team this season. It's the Tipco team, the Silicon Valley Bank, an American squad, which is managed by Ed Beeman, who's managed many of the men's teams, which has included some of the Australians in the past, like Hink Vogels. And he has said that he's very much looking forward to working with Shannon Molseed in season 2018. There's Rachel Nalen looking very relaxed. She's got one of the big pre-race favourites on her team, which is Katrin Garfoot. Grace Brown for the Holden Gusto team. She's one of the dark horses, one of the domestic teams, which gets an opportunity to race against the world's best. Gina Ricardo on the start line as well for the Staminate squad as they're all getting set just a couple of minutes away before we get started and we'll be hearing the national anthem sung by Rachel Alice. is facing somewhere else. national anthem but the peloton they're anxiously awaiting the start they're just on one minute away kate you've heard the national anthem after race at the world championships with the gold medal around your neck what's it like to hear it before the start of a race it's always a special moment to hear the national anthem i think it turns those nerves it, it almost gives you red light fever because when you hear the anthem you're ready to go it, it evokes a very positive emotion but the riders they look so relaxed they do. They'll get a neutral zone early, 113.3 kilometres. We're just 10 seconds away from getting the neutral started. The race director, Scott Sunderland, nervous moments for him as well as he's out the top of the race director car. The gun goes to get them started and Kiddo Evans wisely with the fingers in both ears, making sure he doesn't get deafened at the start as his legs are still recovering from having done the Swiss people's ride this morning. 87 riders on the start line, 113.3 kilometres. They'll make a left-hand turn in a moment, head towards the Botanic Gardens. Once they get through the gardens and on the road towards Barwon Heads, that's when the racing will get started in earnest. Four kilometres neutralised as the 15 teams ride away, 87 riders in all. Gentle rollout, familiar to anybody that cycles around the city of Geelong. 
It's the second biggest city in the state of Victoria as they now head up into the Botanic Gardens and then out onto the highway. Very interesting course, but we only go around the route once, so the boys have got no, uh, or the girls rather in this case, have got no indication of what is to come. The Australian colours of the Cordamenta real estate team running towards the front with Rachel Nalen, who, when she won this race in 2015, coming into the race, she did not have a contract with one of the trade teams. She was on the last chance saloon, effectively, riding for the national team, a composite team. She hadn't won many races. She'll concede she's not a very quick sprinter. She had to go solo, and she did. Very often, these early season races serve a very pointed uh, purpose for the athletes. For Rachel, gosh, that's a tremendous amount of pressure for her to lift under those circumstances. It puts, it, it elevates her, Matt, into a different calibre of rider than we saw before that day. She's just reliable. I know that she's coming in today not entirely confident with her own form, but she's part of a team that has so many different options between Katrin Garfoot and Loretta Hanson, should it come down to a sprint. Tiffany Cromwell, it's all class, the Australian national team. Yeah, there's no weak links in that national team. You've got Peter Mullins in there as well, who's won Australian titles on the track in mountain biking. She's been the criterium champion of the country and the road race champion as well. She has got all bases covered. But I'm not sure that Peter Mullins is in her absolute best form at this point in the season. But Katrin Garfoot, she's pretty close to it. She's targeting the Commonwealth Games. She's off the back of a brilliant end to 2017 with a bronze and a silver medal at the World Championships. The disadvantage for Katrin Garfoot if she is in such great form, she ended the season so well, she'll be so heavily marked. But we've seen with Amanda Spratt and the likes of Katrin Garfoot and Mick Van Bloten that sometimes being in tremendous form, it's not a disadvantage because people might know that they can't let them go anywhere, but when they attack, the power in their legs is just too strong. Katrin is incredibly motivated for the Commonwealth Games. She's targeting it like no other athlete in the field out there. I'm so impressed with her early season format, and I just think that you know, any rider, any team would be absolutely foolish to give her too much rope today. Well, being a naturalised uh, Queenslander, she's from Germany originally, um, and she's now come home in effect. She's cancelled all the European contracts now, and she's racing purely here. The game's a big target for her. She may have learned a lesson. She made a big mistake in the National Road Race Championship. She went too soon, wiped out in sight, almost could touch the finishing line. And fair to say that in commentary, I can see to go in too soon as well. I thought she was home with even 100 I'm metres afraid, to go. A fatal mistake for the commentator, Matt. I commentated her as the winner. It was that close and she was caught. That was a brilliant win, though, for Shannon Molseed, who starts this race wearing the colours as the Australian national champion, riding for her new American squad, which is uh, Tipco Silicon Valley Bank. She'd already gained the contract with that team prior to winning the Australian championships, Shannon Molseed because she won the National Road Series here one year ago. She was very chuffed when she received her new kit. I saw her uh, yesterday. She had a big smile on her face. What do they say? Winners are grinners. I think that's definitely true. But more than that, it gives her a lot of confidence. We have an incredibly deep international field here. But to be able to say that some of the biggest hopes for the race are the Australians, the Australian national team, Mitchelton Scott, and the likes of Shannon Molseed, that's a great credit to what our Australian women are capable of on an international level. There's a long list of favourites, but the number one, without question, is the woman who wears number one. She's the number one ranked cyclist in the world, and she comes here as the defending champion, riding for the Mitchelton Scott team. Here is the Dutch woman, Annemiek Van Vluten. That's still a bit strange for me. If you say that to me, that I'm the number one in the UCI ranking, it's never a goal for me. Um, yeah, I think I had an amazing season. That is what's always been a dream for me to be a world champion, and then you finally achieved it. And uh, that was really good to celebrate that with my mom, that was also there. It was without question the highlight of the world championships in 2017. Not just the going across the fish line for Anna Van Wilson but seeing her celebrate it with her mum. It's a beautiful moment. Well, you can't get it. She can't possibly repeat her season of last year. It was so good, but she can try and equal it, as will the team, uh, team Mitchells and Scott. Well, Scott Sunderland is the man in the hot seat now, waiting to pull in that red flag. 
Uh, I'm a bit surprised they don't release the rides a little bit earlier because this is a nice racing stretch of road here, Matt. And these are roads that you know so well, Phil. Yes, For indeed. many years, we've had stages of the Jayco Bay Cycling Classic through these parklands, and a lot of the riders in the race would be very familiar with the roads also. Well, the thing is, they've missed out a nice little hill uh, to get things rolling, and a fast start, that hill could have caused damage. But anyway, we're heading out towards the Port Arlington Road at the moment under the guise of Scott Sunderland, who himself was a great, a particularly one-day rider. Comes from Inverell. There he is with the red flag, Scott Sunderland, a former seventh-place finisher at the World Championships, and he won an Australian National Road title way back in 1986 as a 19-year-old, his first year out of the juniors. Well credentialed for the race directorship, the women are in good hands. On one hand, it's such a nice to have a good neutral zone. It serves as a nice warm-up and gets a bit of nerves out. But on the other hand, there's a lot of jockeying for position, and quite often the riders know just how important it is with the winds that could potentially be facing them as they head out to Bowen Heads to get in the right position. The roads are narrower at uh, this point. The it's ladies have a long race ahead. Cycling the new golf, or is golf the new cycling? Which way around does it go? Well, I'll tell you, in Britain, it's cycling is uh, is the, the sport now. We have nine golf courses by where I live. We've got one left. And they're all blaming the men in Lycra. Really? Mm. But none of them turned into velodromes, Phil. Nor top cyclists, come to think of it. <laughs> Worth noting, Kate, the teams that are milling towards the front throughout the neutral zone, it's some of the teams that don't have a big standout favourite. And these are the teams that we expect to attack early. Well, we can see a couple of riders from Team Virtue Cycling. They've got Linda Willemson, who's been world champion in the individual time trial before. Last week at Tour Down Under, on two of the days, she heavily animated uh, the stages with very long solo breakaways. I laughed at the time. I thought you'd be crazy to let a former world time trial champion out solo. I mean, that's, you know, just playing into her hands. They'll be motivated today to make... Uh, some moves and, and just to be the aggressor early on it really suits their team tactics now one woman who without question is super motivated today is the woman that wears the colors as the current Australian champion Shannon Molsey here she is speaking to us yesterday I remember watching Amanda Spratt in the same position um, a few years ago and yeah just wanting to be I uh, aspire to Amanda and um, to be in that position now this year riding with my uh, new team to Paris Silicon Valley Bank is just yeah, an amazing feeling. I feel a little bit of internal pressure um, knowing that you know I, I am on good form but can I actually shape up against a peloton full of really strong women um, and also a, a little bit of external pressure like do people expect me a bit more from me now that I'm in the jersey um, but I know that I've done the preparation and same thing with nationals if I can give myself a chance, that's all I need, so. Well, she's got herself in the right position. The race is now officially underway. Shannon Molseed is riding up towards the front. She's on the left-hand side of the peloton, just hiding behind a few of the big Dutch woman, women who ride for the Well Deals Pro Cycling Team. They're the ones in the green colours, a team that I expect to be in any early moves that do go up the road. We heard from Shannon there. She mentioned Amanda Spratt, somebody who she's been inspired by. But she won't be intimidated by her, and she got the better of Amanda Spratt at the Australian Championships. It's an interesting almost changing of the guard when uh, the mentees become the mentors of the next generation and are racing alongside uh, in equal measure to their heroes. For Shannon, it would have been a great honour to stand on the start line. Of course, it's a rite of passage uh, when you're an accomplished rider and you're wearing such a jersey to get a call up to the start line. So you don't have to stand back and watch it happen. You, in fact, uh, get to be there as part of part of it yourself. Shannon would have taken a lot of confidence out of those small moments. And there she is, just standing up on the left-hand side of the peloton she was, about four rows back, wearing number 51. Sydney Uni, Stamina 8 team. I expect them to try and get themselves into the breakaway. At the Towards Zero Race Melbourne event, which was held at Albert Park on Thursday, they were very aggressive. They got into the first breakaway, and that was Megan Scott, the rider from that team, that managed to get them into the breakaway on that occasion. Yeah, Annette Edmondson, the winner there. She's had a good start to the season in winning in South Australia as well as here in Melbourne. Nice little warm-up as they start to get themselves into the rhythm again. For another long year ahead of them, of course. 
Owen Kitchen, number 133 down there. She has been in the top five last year. I'd love to repeat that position this time out. Trek drops team moving around the outside. That's Taylor Wiles, who was a rider that spent a season, or was it two seasons, with the Mitchelton Scott team. And she's a rider that their team manager, Mitchell, from Mitchelton Scott, Jean Bates, has said she's got the physical capability. But sometimes she lacks the confidence when it gets a little bit tight and you have to push and shove in the crosswind. She'll be pretty pleased with the weather conditions today because they're fairly still. It's not uncommon for some of the athletes uh, to be stronger in one element. Of course, it's a very important element, tactics, bunch skills and how you handle that. You can waste an awful lot of energy either wanting fighting to sit right at the front or right at the back. But we will see some of the world's best. Judith Arndt, one of the best women ever to uh, climb onto a bike. We used to see that a lot, the front or the back. It was a bit scary when she headed toward the front, actually. It made everybody else nervous. It's great to see some Australian talent. We have three domestically based teams riding here today. Team Holden Gusto, specialised women's racing and of course Sydney Uni Staminade. We can see two of their riders there. Gina Ricardo, she's quite an experienced rider and she's one of these riders, Matt, who takes her bikes on adventures. She's not a typical training interval kind of athlete. She goes all around the world doing different kinds of adventures but always on two wheels. And she's a rider who's proven herself capable of winning at a national level. She's yet to demonstrate that at an international level. So today's her chance. Well, you, you always need a breakthrough moment. Shannon Molseed, she's had her breakthrough moment from being a dominant domestic rider to now absolutely considered a threat for the win today. Well, they've gone up to quite a high speed here, so I think they've got a favourable win. What win there is, it's only blowing about nine kilometres an hour, but they're picking it up nicely. And while they're riding at this sort of tempo, it's going to be difficult to break riders away from the front of the bunch, being led by Eva Berman and Catherine Boos at the moment. As we see Shannon Malseed here, just checking out what's happening. Only three kilometres into the race. The challenge is very much ahead. And at last, a little move. It's Eva Berman who's put it in. This is uh, Baviera Gurici that's going forward, the Italian rider from the Virtues cycling team. And she was very good on Thursday at Towards Zero Race Melbourne. She picked up the immediate sprint prizes. She was really active, really aggressive. And she's not a rider, Kate, who would fancy herself on the final climbs towards Geelong. So she clearly wants to go early. Well, they have some real smarts in their team car with team director Carmen Small. She's been on the podium at World Championships before in individual time trials. But more than that, she was really known for her tenacity uh, out in a road race. I know Carmen is really pushing these girls to test their limits. A lot of them have come to Australia not entirely confident on their early season form, but I, I overheard one of their team meetings in Adelaide last week and she was really pumping them up. It was kind of like Friday Night Lights match. She was really motivating them and saying, you've got nothing to lose. We saw that in the way that they raced both in Adelaide and at Albert Park a few days ago. We can really expect a lot of animation from those ladies today. And don't forget too, Carmen Small uh, has brought her own career to an end prematurely because of a crash and she still has daily headaches from concussion. So she's now become a director sportive. It's a it's a job she's finding very daunting, uh, but she's loving it nonetheless. The Australian champion, Shannon Moll, said she's worked her way towards the front. At the very start of the race, when the national anthem was being played, she sat alongside the dual world champion, Georgia Bronzini, who won her first world title right here in Geelong eight years ago. And we caught up with the Italian just yesterday. I had a lot of memories, obviously, and for me, you know, that day was a big day and unexpected also for me, that win, and uh, made me the most <laughs> happy girl in the world that day. So I really need to give back a lot to Gillen. I had the privilege to speak to her a lot longer after that interview, and she really does love Geelong, and she is not backing herself as one of the favourites to win today because of the climb of Chalamba Crescent. But let's not forget, when she won that world title eight years ago, she made it over that climb six times. Today, she needs to do it once. She's a pretty classy rider. Eight years ago uh, can be quite almost a lifetime in an athlete's career, but you can never, ever write Georgia Bronzini off. She's won in many moments where people thought or said, dared to say that she wasn't on a lot of form. She's been riding into form uh, through this summer. She's a bit of an adopted 
Australian. She just loves it out here. She's raced with a lot of Australians in teams, in Italian teams and foreign teams. And I know that when she lands here, she feels a little bit at home and that comfort really does help out on the road. Yeah, not only has she ridden some of the big international races here, she spent time doing events like the Jayco Bay Cycling Classic, which is based in Geelong. So she'll know the roads, perhaps even better than some of the Australians that aren't Victorian based because she's done a lot of training around this region. Peloton all together, 87 riders taking to the start line today. Swinging out towards Barwon Heads now as we make a direction change here. They have started very, very quickly, and as you can see the tactics by some of the teams here looking for a move, especially from Trek and also from the Virtue Cycling Team and Team 2020. Moving riders all the time up the pack. A lot of daylight down the back end, which means that coming off those bottom bends, some of these women are not catching those wheels quick enough. Onto the ball and heads road now. Team Arle Cipollini, Australian sprinter Chloe Hosking is riding for them. And Phil, she was in great form in Adelaide. She took out the closing stage of the she women's did. tour down under. Yep. It's hard at this time of season to know whether the riders are on good form. So those few races we've had, they go to show a lot of indicators. She's very motivated to get on the team for Commonwealth Games. Uh, when she was victorious there, it was a great Italian celebration. For, she said afterwards, oh, of course we celebrate like that, we're Italian. I said, Chloe, no, you're Australian. <laughs> oh, oh, yes, she said. But she's really taken on board uh, the culture at that team, and I think it's lifted her to another level. I agree, and there the jerseys really stand out, those orange and yellow jerseys, all spread around the peloton just now. Chloe was fourth last year, behind Sprat, Nalen and Danielle Rowe. We'll see. She did win that race well. I was there in, in Adelaide, and she had a perfect lead out for over four kilometres by the team. Well, we just saw it. We just saw Amanda Spratt, number two. She's sitting a few wheels back from the front of the race, and she did win here two years ago. There she is, Amanda Spratt, dual Australian champion, recently the winner of the Stan Sauce Tour down under, and she's optimistic about her chances today. Yeah, that was a really special moment in 2016 to win the race here. It's such a special race uh, for us to win and the atmosphere around here is amazing. The Australian crowd, uh, you could just hear them roaring as I was coming up to that last kilometre and the little downhill towards the finish line and uh, you can hear everyone screaming for you and it's just the atmosphere around this race is what makes it really special as well. There she is, at number two, Amanda Spratt. She won here wearing the colours of the Australian national champion. And Shannon Molsey, the current national champion, has said that Amanda has been an inspiration to her. And for Shannon, she's not intimidated by riding against Amanda Spratt, just even more motivated. <laughs> Amanda's on good form. She really is. So expected to be in the mix again, first and second in the last two shots at this event. She knows what's required. This is Peter Mullins rolling forward in the white colours of the Australian national team, the Corda Mentha Real Estate Squad. She is one of the most versatile cyclists Australia has ever produced, winning national titles in virtually all disciplines mm. on the track, mountain biking, on the road, criterium champion as well. And as a kid, she was a wonderful endurance runner. Takes her chances when they present themselves. She never comes marked in as a race favourite. Yet she has all the ability to deliver at the finishing line. There's Amanda Spratt. Kate, you saw her at the Tour Down Under just recently. She was in brilliant form, particularly that stage win that she took out into Handorf. When she went into Handorf, when she attacked, it was incredible. She just, the power that she was producing up the climb, she made it look like it was completely flat or downhill. I've seen Amanda Spratt on form before, but actually this year I feel like she's stepped it up another level normally you know in years past we've seen her donning the green and gold we've taken that as a show of form she doesn't have that this year Shannon Molseed took that title but the way she was riding in Adelaide incredibly dominant performance she's got some really big goals this year and I know that she's taking a slightly different approach to the season than she has previously and from what I've seen so far I could be quite confident that for her that some of those new goals are well within reach. Number 12, this is the former Dutch national champion. This is Anushka Costa. And each of the riders from this team, the Wild Deals Pro Cycling Team, a new team on the block for Dutch cycling, 
when you ask any of them in the lead up to this race oh, you look like you're in good form will you be the protected rider oh no it's not me on it's i'm going okay but working better is they've all nominated somebody else well that's typical of the director sportif uh, jerome blyleavens who is a great tour de france rider I won many stages in the sprint and he's a crafty Dutchman so he probably told the girls to say that. Just trying to put everybody else yeah. off the scent. Well number 14 there Sabrina Solzen she actually won the first QOM at the Tour Down Under of all. Unfortunately she pulled out the next day unwell she was incredibly disappointed and uh, a couple of her teammates also fell to the same illness in the following days they've regrouped they've re-steadied we know they are on form i think they're a bit nervous about what happened in adelaide but we know that they're strong riders the qoms out there on course today will certainly suit their strengths they're sitting at the back now i think that's uh just the calm before the storm this is janelle crooks at the front for mitchelton scott speaking of the subaru queen of the mountains there are two queen of the mountains points on today's race the first one comes after 56.7 kilometers covered that's at bells beach and that is as halfway as you're going to get. It's after 56.7 with 56.6 kilometres still to go on the race. That's the first in the battles for the Subaru Queen of the Mountains at Bells Beach. The second one comes just 8.9 kilometres from the finish line up to Lambra Crescent. And I'm not sure at that point it will be a race for the points for that Subaru Queen of the Mountains jersey, more so a race to get away from the sprinters and try and win the event outright. Getting out onto the, the Bellarine Peninsula right now, and the, the peloton really just staying very, very tightly compact here. Good roads, and as you can see, completely closed for the passage of the Deakin University Cadell Evans Great Ocean Road Race to give it its full title, I guess. And uh, th this isn't conducive to attacks just at the moment. I think we're going to have to wait till we get into Bow and heads down the road a ways, change direction, head out along the 13th mile. Well, the wind is so calm at the moment, and that's why the race is relatively calm as well, as we see Janelle Crooks at the front. She's protecting two of the favourites, Amanda Spratt directly behind her, and also Anna Mick Van Vluten, who not only comes to Australia for a pre-season training, she also likes to discover the country. I went surfing on the Great Ocean Road. I stayed also for training, and then in the afternoon I did uh, go surfing. I stayed in Kennard River. It was beautiful to ride there also. But I also had three weeks of holiday. I went hiking on Hinchingbrook Island, only with camping gear, and I had to take all my food with me. I uh, we went for three days uh, liveaboard in Cairns on the, on the Great Barrier Reef scuba diving with my best friend. So I did some good wine tasting in the uh, Margaret River, so uh, I, I travelled around a bit. She really knows how to enjoy herself as we see the first serious attack to come out of the peloton. And this is Lisa Monzenti, the young Italian rider who's just 20 years of age and it was only three days ago that she celebrated her 20th birthday last year she rode with the Astana team as a first year senior up out of the under 19 junior category she struggled across at the tour down under she was eliminated on the first stage been outside the time delay so she's bounced back with some real vigor a lot of the international riders struggled when they first landed in Australia the temperature differential it's hard to imagine what it does to your body when you leave uh, minus 10 over in Europe and land in Adelaide uh, to 40 plus degrees. Some of the riders, it takes a little bit longer to acclimatise and the first day out there in Adelaide was 37 degrees and it seriously took its toll on a lot of the international riders. Much milder conditions here today. There's going to be nobody going for this at all because she's not an experienced rider. She was eliminated in the Tour Down Under on the opening day. Here is a reaction, and this is coming from Barbara Gurici, who was the first rider to attack, and clearly she's got ambitions to try and get off the front. Nolan Swinkles is the rider that is behind her, so it is causing a bit of a reaction. There are plenty of riders in this race who don't fancy themselves on that final climb, so they want to get a head start and put some pressure on. This kind of racing will go exactly counter to what some of the sprinters are hoping for, which is an easier rollout uh, to bow and heads. It's not too windy out on course, but they will be riding into a slight headwind. That does not favour any breakaways, but numbers do. And if they can group as five, it gives them a lot better chance. Fewer teams to chase if you've got five represented in that break. Well, tactically, you saw the bright colours of the LA Cipollini team. They were marking that counter-attack. 
They're one of the teams with a sprinter, Chloe Hosking. If a break goes, they'll want to make sure that they're represented so they don't have to chase. But their strategy, surely, Kate, would be keep the race as calm as possible for Chloe to have fresh legs on that climb of Chalambra Crescent. As calm as possible. In previous years, we've seen some breakaways go early and instead of the breakaway being reeled back what's actually happened is there's been counter-attacks and riders that have bridged across to the break that is not what chloe hosking and her team arlai cipollini are after today that will not be helpful uh, to their cause one rider out solo phil is very very well, difficult for one rider on their own they've a they know that she hasn't got any hope of taking this race to the line but they're using her as a carrot in fact they've wound her back in now they tried one tentative, it didn't work. The peloton were very uh, vigilant and jumped on that move, and now it's all over here. We're back to the status quo again, and just 11 kilometres covered. Their own teammate has actually come up to the front there as well. Ali Cipollini, though, they are the ones paying attention just now in those orange and yellow jerseys. In the first three editions of the race, the intermediate sprints included one intermediate sprint going through Barwon Heads. That's changed for 2018. There's the first intermediate sprints, that's in Torquay, that's with 66 kilometres still to race. The second is in series at 15.8 kilometres. And the final points on offer in the race for the MAPI sprint prize is actually on the finish line. The points allocation for each of those sprints, three points for the win, two and one for the minor placings. So there are three points where those points will be added up together. Torquay, Series, and at the finish line in Geelong. We can't understate the importance of the intermediate sprints and the QOMs. There will be a lot of riders and a lot of teams who are aiming uh, for some representation into those. Often the sprinters will also use it just to test their legs a little bit, give it a bit of a hit out, especially if they've been uh, just rolling out. You can see some of the riders, they're not applying a lot of power to the pedals. They are pedaling a few free wheels uh, going on there. The speed back in the bunch, it allows the riders to get quite a bit of recovery as they're rolling along. The speeds are quite high in previous years, Phil. They're averaging 38 to 40 kilometres an hour, yeah, so they are quick. ticking along. And that's why we're not getting anybody away. I think we've got to wait for a change of direction here. Everybody's pedaling very fast. Nobody's struggling, it seems, on this wide road here. We're heading out towards the airport out of Barwon Heads, where all our television helicopters were housed overnight. And good, fast tempo riding, and the high speed at 40-plus kilometres an hour is easily preventing an attack. There's no opportunity just yet. This is Megan Scott from the Sydney University Staminate team, riding at the front of the peloton. 36-year-old lawyer who's been racing bikes for just on one year. She was a good middle distance runner. She walked into a bike shop one day with a front wheel that needed to be fixed. She walked out with a whole new road bike and started racing around about a week later. Well, sometimes time on bike doesn't actually indicate uh, how competent the riders are. We see sometimes it takes the athletes a few years to get used to the bunch tactics and the sport in a strategic sense. One rider that we haven't seen her head poked through yet is Grace Brown riding for the Holden team Gusto. She has been unbelievable over the summer, Matt. I yep. really, Mark, you know, watch this space. I think that she will be one of the riders that will go from domestic dominance uh, to international very quickly. She's only been on the bike for a couple of years, a former runner. We've got a number of the Sydney Uni Staminade riders in a similar boat. They've crossed over from other sports, so they're actually very fit, and it's just about learning the, the race craft. So Grace Brown, when you're looking for it, you can see the right at the front with the Holden Gusto kit on, number 104. That is Matilda Reynolds. She's one of the teammates of Grace Brown. Grace is significantly shorter. She packs plenty of punch on the climbs. She's had brilliant results, as you mentioned, already in 2018. She won a National Road Series event, the Tour of the Mercy Valley, in 2017. And already the international teams are taking a very close look at her. There'll be some real interest in Grace Brown and how she performs. And there she is, number 102. So of the riders from the Holden Gusto team, she's the one that's got the slightly different coloured bike. She's got the blue and white bike. 
The rest of them are on black bikes, so it'll be easy to mark her throughout the race. Well, Matilda Reynolds is a really good example of an athlete who's swapped from another sport. She was a former triathlete, very good triathlete, and uh, she's had some great results over the summer. And last year, she did this incredible trip over to Mount Everest and rode her bike up to Everest Base Camp. Pretty incredible. And she said the benefits from that, just in mental strength and resilience, have really helped her over the summer. She, her job today is to look after Grace. So I think when we see Matilda, we'll also see Grace. Grace just needs to stay calm. She's certainly got the physical fitness. Uh, perhaps on this kind of stage, she will be a little well, bit nervous. Well, there's been a crash, crash. on the uh, left-hand side of the screen, the right-hand side of the peloton. It looks like it's the bright colours, potentially, of the LA Cipollini We've team. We've got Cadell Hodges the side. down there on the left. Also... And that's uh, Roxanne Kanademan that's gone down by the looks of it from... And from the... The New Zealand national champion has also gone down. That's Georgia Williams in the white colours. Kanateman is the rider from the LA Cipollini team. It's horrid to see them not get up like this. Roxanne Kanateman looks like she's not in a great way. Georgia Williams, the national champion from New Zealand, is struggling to change her wheel there from the Mitchelton Scott team. The pace has accelerated. I don't, I don't love that, Matt. I've got to say, when there's a crash early on, and the field accelerates. It is part of bike racing, but I think the Mitchelton Scott girls will certainly not be pushing the pace. Well, is that acceleration, there? though, the cause of the nervous tension? Sorry, go, Phil. I just saw the pace had increased dramatically there while you were talking about the teams, and it became a cavalry charge. And those girls trying to come up on the inside had gone off the edge of the road, and I think that probably caused the crash. This is Sarah Roy now coming to the front. That crash has created a whole lot of nervous tension in the peloton. And the one way to stay out of trouble is to ride at the front and up the tempo. Well, we just saw her increase the pace, then put her hand to her ear. They've got radios. I'm sure she would have been told they have a teammate in the crash. The pace slowed down. The team is all coming to the front to control the pace of the race somewhat. Wiggle high five. Don't want to play that game, though. Nettie Edmondson forcing the pace up to the front with some teammates on her wheel. This is Annette Edmondson at the front. She was the winner of the race on Thursday towards Zero Race Melbourne. Here's another look at it. On the right-hand side of the screen, and Roxanne Kanademan was taken out from behind, so unlucky, That's with a, a small fault. touch of wheels just behind her and to the left. It was a very clear case of one of the riders trying to push out and accelerate up. Just another shot from it here. Oh, the riders just had no choice but to go over the top there. Roxanne Knateman really kind of copped the, the bad end of that. We haven't heard any reports on how she's going there. Unfortunately, that, it doesn't look good. It's horrid to watch, Phil. That, well, it is, and um, on such a silly situation now, on a straight road, and they're, they're often the hard falls because you don't expect to fall off, especially if you're hit from behind. Riders are getting away, as we just see here, pushed off as Scotty Lechuga from America, but I don't think they're going anywhere because they're too far behind. And we haven't seen any movement from Roxanne Kinnateman, one of the famous names mm. of Dutch cycling film. Very much indeed. Jerry, uh, her, was it her father? Her father, yeah. Yeah, he was the world champion back in 1978. He was a great friend too, Eddie Kinnateman. Yeah, he had some bad crashes too in his career. Once saved his own life, he hit a car and he had to stop, he, he broke an artery and the only reason he lived before the ambulance got there, he, he tied up his whole arm with his hand and held it dead tight and he came back to be world champion. And now, Kate, the tempo in the peloton has really calmed down. Well, I think the riders are very nervous. Falls, they, they reverberate through the peloton in a wave of nervousness, but nobody is going to push the pace while the riders are rejoining unless it's a crucial time in the race it's not uh, the riders are just rolling along whether the riders can rejoin or not that's another thing uh, but the peloton are certainly not in a hurry to go anywhere i think the only thing we'll see is some of the riders wanting to get to the front and stay out of trouble it, a lot of those crashes happen with a touch of wheels as they try a little bit in desperation to come up the side when they see an opportunity for acceleration. The first thing on the map, Phil, is the intermediate sprint. Yeah. They're not quite there yet. I think we'll see the pace increase significantly heading into that. Yeah, 47 kilometres into the day of the 113 is the first sprint in Torquay. Famous for its surf, and on this occasion, 
famous for the Deakin University Elite yep. Women's Road Race. I think here now they've uh, they've kind of relaxed now there's been that crash and they've turned off what was becoming quite a dangerous cavalry charge. Nobody behind. I, I, the women are riding back there, but I can't see them rejoining the group. They lost too much time. Well, even if they do rejoin the group, what's the damage that's been done? Yes. The confidence has been knocked around, the physical damage as well, the energy spent trying to rejoin the race. This is the specialised women's racing team at the front. That's Ella Bloor that you can see at the head of the peloton, number 112. The Kiwis, the New Zealand national team, they're all young riders. They're all under 23 years of age, the New Zealanders. And in particular, at the recent Santos Tour Down Under, Grace Anderson looked very good. Grace Anderson was tremendous. She took out the uh, young riders competition and she's very young and very humble. And I think she was, to start with, just very honoured to be part of the race. That's Scotty Lechuga. Yeah, she looks as though she's going pretty well. Now this technically is a 100% illegal riding behind a team car. There's only one penalty, disqualification. I'm shaking my head a bit. It's almost the unwritten rule that after a crash, uh, the cars will help you back through the convoy. It's not clear from that shot whether the car is at, in fact at the back of the convoy, but uh, based on the know, aerial technically shot, that's, that's not really good form. But in saying that, Matt, I don't think the other riders would have a massive problem with, with doing that. They don't see it um, as cheating, in fact. So it's, I, I'm going to call it a grey area, that rule. On paper, it might look very firm, but actually adherence to it, yeah, it tends to be a bit more grey. That aerial shot and a chance to take a look at the convoy. It's not a particularly long convoy in this race. And I'm certain with how long that she was on the side of the road that that car was not at the tail end of the convoy. And there was a big gap between that car and the chase for Lechuga. I, I was giving the benefit of the doubt there. Well, <laughs> Once you hit the back of the convoy, you're safe again. You know, even if you take your time to jump one car there's at the, evidence. the time. Oh, that's, yeah. We'll see what the commissaires say about that. Heading now down towards Barwon Heads, the home of Cadell Evans. When? He's in Australia, at least. <laughs> That's also true. But Cadell's right here in Geelong at the moment. He saw the start of this race. He'll be very much in evidence for the men's race on Sunday as well. They've got their tempo going again. At this sort of tempo, no one can get off the front of this bunch. So the wind is being very kind to them. It will pick up, I'm, I'm convinced, on the borders of the ocean as we swing away into Barwon Heads and down the 13th mile. Well, we can see it's very open, so when there are crosswinds, it absolutely rips the field apart. The weather has been very kind mm. uh, to the athletes today. I think there'll be well, a we few don't of want them it to be kind, relaxing. Really, do well, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> love to see the yeah. action but i know some of the teams uh, for every kilometer that is a little bit calmer they take a deep breath and get a bit more confidence heading into the second part of the race watching area yonami from uh, the wiggle high five squad she's the champion of japan there's how we bring you the pictures off to the right from our helicopter rides off uh, clear of the race of course he doesn't want the downdraft of the rotors to make a problem for the race we can see from the pictures, Phil, that there aren't actual gutters on the edge of the road. So sometimes when the field is spread out the entire width of the road, you do have some problems uh, with falls because if you get a little bit too close, there's almost no safety net. If you flick off into the sand or the grass, you can be quite reactionary in how you handle your bike uh, to get back in. The athletes need to take care with that. Often when they're fatigued, they're the little mistakes that can cost a rider, a group of riders, the race, essentially. Number 31 sitting towards the back of the peloton. That's Chloe Hosking. It was her teammate, Roxanne Kinederman, who was one of the riders who crashed. And we haven't seen any signs of Roxanne Kinederman returning to the race. We'll bring you any updates that we are able to get from out on the road. You know, also on that team, Mayuka Hagawara, the former Japanese national champion. She's also a contender today. She's finished on the podium in this race in the past, and she'll be one of the dark horses with the LA Cipollini team, if that's possible when you're wearing such bright colours.
has been a great start to the year for all of the women based here in Australia. The first big objective of the race. See a change of direction waiting for us. We're looking for a chance to try and go across. Another attack. The race is on. It's on. The complexion of the race completely changes. It's going to cause a little bit of a surprise. So finely poised. What a great bike race it has been. It's Annemiek Van Vluten, who is Van Vrijens. And it is the stunning city of Geelong that plays as the backdrop to the Deakin University Killer Levens Great Ocean Road Race, the fourth edition of this event. And today, Geelong is showing off. The weather conditions are ideal. Temperatures rising towards 30 degrees and barely a breath of wind. All the yachts, they're docked in at Carayo Bay. Let's now take a look at the course. It's 113 kilometres. They start neutral in Geelong through the Botanic Gardens, head down towards Barwon Heads. Then along 30 13th Beach, where the wind could be a factor, into Torquay for the first of the Mapai Intermediate Sprints, on the Bells Beach for the first of the Subaru Queen of the Mountains points, along Forest Road and through to Ceres for the next of the sprints in the race for the Mapai Sprint Queen jersey, on to Chalamba Crescent, the most critical point of this race, and also an opportunity to pick up points in the race for the Queen of the Mountains prize. And then the finish line in the heart of Geelong, right on Corio Bay, in front of Steam Packet Gardens. Phil Liggett is with me. I'm Matthew Keenan. And Phil, today the weather conditions are perfect. We have a brilliant international field headed up by the Mitchelton Scott team. We have 15 uh, top women's teams here in the world. We've got the world number one here, of course, uh, Van Vluten. And, uh, and, a, and a great field. We're opening up the season here in Victoria. And after this, they'll be heading across through Asia and Europe. And it's a beautiful day, as you say, Matt. Not enough wind for my liking. It might increase once we're out onto the... 13. The race is underway, so let's have a look at the story so far. Scott Sullen, the race director, bringing the flag in. The first rider to attack was Barbara Gurici from the Virtue cycling team. She was the initial aggressor, and then once she was brought back, it was Lisa Morzetti from the B Pink squad who went off the front. We then saw a nasty fall. The biggest victim of that that we've noted so far is Roxanne Kinateman. The New Zealand national champion at Georgia Williams was also caught up in that crash. And so too from the 2020 squad, Luguchi, who's trying to make her way back to the peloton. The peloton is all still together. The weather, though, they'll be pleased with it. Those that participated in the Swiss people's ride this morning, the weather was a lot cooler then. But we're heading towards a top of 30 degrees today. But Phil, as you alluded to a moment ago, the wind traditionally in this race has been a major factor. Today it's only nine kilometres per hour and it's just been swirling around, no real clear direction. No direction at all and it's, it's a breeze at the moment, nine, nine kilometres an hour, it's just over five miles an hour. As we're looking now at another little move going off the front, this is Abby Snedden, the Australian on Sydney Uni stage. That crash we saw came 10 kilometres into the race. It's 113 kilometres, about 70 miles in total and once again it's the beat pink team trying to get into the breakaway Velocetti, another one of the italian riders from the race is trying to go into that break also responding this is anna travesi so the italians so far have been the aggressive all the three major attacks have been led by italian riders might tell us something uh, there's an awful lot of australian riders who would like to, to win this race of course uh, two Australians and a Dutch woman in the history of this race have been the winners. Last year's winner was Amanda Spratt, Van Vluten and Rachel Nalen back in 2015, all in the race today. Well, that has really stretched this field out because we've been doing what I call tempo riding at round about 43, 45 kilometres an hour. But now, as we're closing in on Torquay, first sprint point, one woman trying to get clear of the field here is Abby Snedden. And really good to see the Sydney University Staminade women's cycling team really showing plenty of aggression in this race. It's great to see the domestically based team Sydney Uni Staminade are doing a great job. We've seen the pink at the front of the bunch quite a lot today. We can tell that they're quite set on making their mark on the race. As you look through their start list, there's not one rider in particular who we would say is necessarily uh, the big threat from them, but they're certainly taking uh, the bull by the horns, so to speak, 
and making and animating this race. A lot of the way that you win bike races, Matt, is just through aggression tactics and animating it. It's, it's almost a, you've got to be in it to win it. And uh, if they are riding along all day at snail's pace, uh, that's not going to happen. They have had a fast tempo today so far that no breakaways have been allowed to succeed. It's, she's opening a good gap, but Phil, gee, you don't really want to go alone, do you? It's a big no. ask with a lot of kilometres left to race. And that is the only reason the peloton has not reacted here. One woman is not going to make it home on this course, and they know it. So they'll leave her out there as a carrot, see if it attracts someone else to try and get up to her. But with the climb at the end of a Shalamra Crescent, uh, this high speed will cause that the race to break up on that climb. Oh, when you attack like that, you have these moments where you turn around and there's nobody with you and you kind of think, oh, no. <laughs> Gee, I wish I had a, uh, a mate out here to keep me company and, and roll some turns. But she's certainly going for it. Rider number 125, Georgia Whitehouse from the Staminade Sydney Uni team. I think she figures she's out there. She may as well give it a good crack. She's made the effort uh, so far. And she's riding with a steady pace, steady tempo. And she's now coming into Barwon Heads as we'll head out onto the road as well as we're joined by the three-time Green Jersey winner from the Tour de France, Robbie McEwen. He can't help himself. He's still in the race, but he's out there on a motorbike. Robbie, what have you made of the first 20 kilometres or so? Well, Matt, as you said, I'm in the race, but my only way of keeping up with these elite women is, is on the back of the motorbikes. I'm happy to be here. Beautiful day. And as you've alluded to, very little to no wind. So it's it's been limited to sort of minor skirmishes, just individual attacks here up the road. And, and then we saw, of course, that nasty crash by Roxanne Kniedemann. We, we stopped very briefly, and it seems she had a, a lot of discomfort uh, on the left side of her rib cage. That's what she seemed to be... Um, complaining about telling the, the medics and they were actually just about to put her into the back of an ambulance and take her off to hospital for scans. But, um, you know, she was conscious, she was talking, she was moving her arms and legs, um, but she was in quite a bit of pain. So it's a real blow for, for Roxy Kniedemann to, to be out of the race yeah, a... with a crash and also so soon after just 10 kilometres. And I think the team will also really miss her presence, very experienced. And such an innocent victim, she was taken out from behind. But what I do like, Robbie, is that you're using your motorbike pilot, Fletcher's back, as your clipboard. Yeah, you can see that. So I've just actually uh, pilfered some tape off the back of his motorbike, torn it into little pieces. So I've got uh, all the information I need in front of me with the whole start list. Um, but interesting, though, I'm seeing from the back of the peloton at the moment, a lot of our pre-race favourites are happy at the moment to just hang down the back and take a back seat. I can see Annemiek van Vluten from here. I can see Amanda Spratt, just two riders across from her. I've seen Chloe Hosking hanging around the back. So that wind is really not a concern, and they're just happy to let their teammates do any necessary work to hold the field together, and they'll make their attack when they want to later. But because there's no wind, it's really quite a relaxed atmosphere in the bunch, and uh, they're just cruising along and enjoying the sights as they come into Barwon Heads now. Thanks, Robbie. We'll get down to Robbie regularly throughout the race as we go back to the head of the race. This is Georgie Whitehouse from the Sydney University Staminade women's team. She's making the right-hand turn. If she had have kept going straight, it would have been over the famous bridge of Barwon Heads and towards Ocean Grove. This is Hitchcock Avenue that they're heading down now. And his Provador is down to the left-hand side, which is the favourite cafe of Kid Levens. Yeah, there's one, two very nice cafes down there, some good pie shops as well, as we're now making our exit from Barwon Heads. It's a very, very nice area to live. Blue waters off the shoulders of the riders. Heading out now to Torquay. We are approaching the sprint uh, in the old days of this race, over the last three years. We've moved the sprint point down to Torquay. 47 kilometres into the 113. Everybody staying together. As, uh, as Robin McEwen said, this no win factor is actually causing uh, no opportunity on this course at the moment to attack. It's but difficult, that can change. It's difficult from the television to see the impact that the wind does have. But the way we can see it is through the tactics and the way that they're riding. When there's strong crosswinds, we often see them break up into um, echelons, into straight line where some riders can gain some advantage over others. The no wind factor is really playing into the hands of Georgia Whitehouse. The field, they're not chasing at all. Georgia is 
probably pretty happy to be in a breakaway, but probably wanting a little bit of company, a bit lonely out there. Well, the point that she's on now, this is along 13th Beach, and this is a stretch of road that has been used in the past for the Jaco Herald Sun Tour. And in 2009, they had a stage finish right here next to where the golf course is. And it was so windy on that occasion, with Chris Sutton winning the stage ahead of his teammate, Bradley Wiggins, that when the stage presentation was done, we were standing underneath a almost five metre awning, hard up against the back of the stage presentation area. The wind was coming down sideways and was still getting wet from around about the waist down. It was blowing a fierce scale. Today, it couldn't be better. And some of the most stunning coastline in the country. In fact, some of the most stunning coastline in the world. Well, let's hope it's uh, the calm days are aiding the endangered budded plover, which lives on the beaches here. And uh, it's a huge problem because people's dogs uh, tend to crush the eggs. But it's a very, very rare plover now. It's also home of the orange-breasted parrot. In case you don't know, which migrates so far away from Tasmania occasionally. Oh, I did some facts there I didn't go. know there, Phil. <laughs> They're your indigenous birds, not mine. <laughs> well, I'm, I, we sit here and look at these beautiful pictures coming through of this gorgeous coastline. The riders don't have much of a chance to take that in, Georgia Whitehouse. She's got an almost 30-second lead now. Until it goes out to over a minute, she has no support uh, from a team car, so should any misadventure happen, uh, she will be swallowed up by the peloton waiting for any service. We wish no misadventure on her, though, of course. I'm not sure it will get out to a minute. It, it is been hovering around the 25 to 30 second mark for a while. They're almost playing a game with her. Uh, and she's playing it with the peloton. She's just hovering out the front as much as they're just allowing her to be there. She's not going full gas at this point. She's desperate. She's gone fishing. She's got the hook out there with a little bit of bait trying to draw somebody out of the peloton and into the breakaway boat with her. Well, they say out of sight, out of mind, but the peloton can still see her uh, up ahead, save for a few little twists and turns. So long as you can see them just up there, it's just a dangling carrot uh, for them. She really isn't riding too hard. She's, she's riding consistently and solidly, but, you know, she's sitting up. She looks pretty relaxed. You could see how easy she was taking it. She was sitting on the tops of the handlebars as opposed yeah, to the brake no levers or into the drops. She did ride the Tour Down Under just recently, finishing in 68th position. She was consistently just in the middle of the field. But that will have given her some confidence that she can ride in an international race. And good to see her getting off the front. You always got to admire an attacking cyclist and you don't build your reputation by staying anonymous all day long in the peloton. So you almost always must take your hat off to an attacker. So good luck to Georgia Whitehouse, even if it probably won't get it to the finishing line in first place. But once we get over the other side of Torquay, the undulations increase. There's some rough uh, hills uh, waiting for these riders, which we don't talk about as uh, king of the mountains, or in this case, queen of the mountains climbs. Well, we don't expect this breakaway to stay away for the entire day, but what it does, Phil, is take the pressure off the teammates. They're sitting back in the peloton. They know they don't need to do a thing. They don't need to sit near the front. They don't need to pay as much attention as the other teams to that time gap. It's sliding out a little bit more toward the 42nd mark as we see some beautiful aerial shots. It really is paradise down there on the Great Ocean Road. No, it's a lovely, lovely scene. I've never seen it look so calm. Normally they're dodging the sandstorms that blow off their heads here. But everybody is watching the race go by and the women are watching progress here of Georgia Whitehouse. Not one of the big names yet in the world of Australian cycling, but she might be one day. She's edged out to 36 seconds, 86 kilometres, just under 54 miles if, for all our international viewers. It's a benefit the Australian riders have at these races, the domestic teams, three of which are out there, Sydney Uni Staminade, Holden Gusto, and of course specialised women's racing, that the international riders may not know their names. And uh, that relative anonymity can help them uh, in breakaways like this, it can really play into the hands of the Australian teams. Phil, I, it, it's such a good opportunity uh, to for the domestic riders to be represented. We've had two Australian winners in the past three editions, Rachel Nalen, of course, Amanda Spratt. Last year, 
Annemiek van Vloten. She spent the whole summer surfing and oh. cuddling the wildlife. We could almost adopt her as an Aussie. You could, but that put her off to the best season she's ever had. Remember, she is the woman in Rio who crashed and looked as though she died on the spot in the Rio Olympic road race. It was a horrible, horrible crash. She tweeted less than 24 hours later she was fine. She didn't look fine on the tweet because she was in hospital, but she came back this last year and had a finer season. It was a fairy tale comeback, and we've already heard her say her close relationship with her mum. Well, you can only imagine what her mum thought when she saw that crash on worldwide television in Rio de Janeiro. She's back now as the world number one, less than uh, 12 months later. 38 seconds is the gap. She's pushing it out as best she can. It might make a minute. They're not chasing her, they're just holding her tempo speed at the moment. Watch out for the great white sharks, that's all I can say. Do they have great white sharks here? Oh, of course they do. Just sure. checking. Look. Are you uh, planning to head out for a surf later? Uh, no, no. no <laughs> I never will go in the ocean. That's the uh, domain of others. When the tide is out like this, it's perfect for beach cricket. Beach cricket? Beach cricket. Well, past the Brits will beat you. Well, I should say the English. It's we play beach cricket. How you bring families together is cricket on the beach in summertime, particularly <laughs> down this region. You Back see, the, this, the, the way this peloton is riding, they're just waiting for an opportunity and just keeping the tempo. Rider number 15 there, Rotten Gavinovich. She's from Israel. We talked to her in Adelaide about what an honour it was for her to represent her country. There's not a lot of uh, Israeli representatives in the international cycling field. It's great to see the diversity of nations. One of the Team 20 well, This is the girl who riders. fell. This is Scotty Lechuga, who clearly has come back to the field, courtesy of a car. And uh, she looks as though she now has a problem she wants to sort out. When we see them reach down to their jersey like that, they do have race radio. So when she picks her jersey up, she's talking to her director uh, in the team car. What then happens is the commissaire will wave them up. And in this case, she's actually dropping back. But if she sat at the back of the peloton, uh, the commissaire would wave their team car up. Perhaps a bit of inexperience in dropping back, but there's a number of her teammates doing so. I'd suggest a bike change. Yes, I think so. And they're waiting uh, for her to pace her back onto the field. She's done a lot of chasing today. That will definitely uh, pay later on in the race. That was damaged in the fall quite clearly, but no time to change. Or maybe it's back to her. It is. It's back to her own bike. She took a spare bike to get back to the race. Now she's got her own bike back because this bike has got the race number on it, whereas the bike that she stepped off did not have the race number on it. So they've fixed up the damage that was done to that bike throughout the crash. But as you mentioned, Kate, a small sign of inexperience by going back to the team car as opposed to staying at the rear of the peloton and waiting for the car to come to her. That's a long way back too. There's a lot of little nuances uh, in road cycling that can really help and play into the hands of the more experienced riders. Riders like Amanda Spratt riding for Mitchelton Scott, that's the kind of knowledge she imparts on the younger, newer riders to the peloton. She tells them uh, these little tips and tricks, and of course their team directors uh, do as well. But she's got two teammates there that will help her pace back on. Erica Clevenger and Danielle Morshed. Three is better than one, Phil. They'll allow her a little bit of recovery. She's done a lot of chasing after that uh, crash already. Make their way through the convoy. The smart way to do this is to take a little bit of rest behind each car and break the effort up. They are doing that. You can see them weaving in and out. It takes a lot of experience by the convoy drivers as well to know that the athletes are in the mix and not cause any accidents. Well, there's the three names for you. This team is managed by Mari Holden, who herself was an Olympic silver medalist a few years ago, and Mari has brought them over. And she clearly tells them how to ride a bike race. Only one cube on what is basically an all-American team. Uh, what does that tell you, though, about Lechuga's protected position within that team? The rider that crashed, she's one of the older riders in the team, one of the older riders in the race at 35 years of age. She's had some success. She's won a couple of stages in a few smaller races. But she comes here after finishing in 33rd position at the Santos Tour Down Under. Yet that team doesn't have a clear standout leader. Perhaps she's the one that they think can perform well on this course. I'd also say safety in numbers. Uh, for Scotty to continue to contribute to the team effort, uh, a little bit of assistance will only put a bit of fatigue in three riders' legs rather than essentially uh, taking Lechuga out of the race 
after too many solo sustained efforts. So it's very savvy riding by the 2020 team as a whole. Uh, they've got Nicola Cranmer sitting back in the car. Actually, I'll tell you what, I'd love to see a bit of a race amongst the incredible director sportives back in the car. We've got some incredible CVs amongst them. It's wonderful to see them impart their knowledge, their strategy, their experience in the sport to the new generation. Team 2020, it was built eight years ago. It was Team 2012 at the time uh, to develop the younger athletes for the Olympics and to go on uh, to professional teams. They've had some great success uh, with some athletes doing that and also supporting some athletes from the track. Georgia Whitehouse from Sydney Uni Staminade. She's been out the front for a while. She's hit that magic minute mark. We didn't know if she'd get there, but that that shows her motivation and also the peloton's motivation in not being too tenacious to chase her down. So for her now, she knows that nobody at this point is going to come across and quickly bridge that gap solo, as might have been the case when she was hovering at the 22nd advantage. So we're heading towards Torquay, which is the first point in the race for the Mapai Sprint classification. And then it's on to series for the second of those destinations. She might start to daydream about an opportunity to get up onto the podium as the winner of the sprint prize. Well, that's a good thought. Well, she's taken 10 kilometres to gain one minute. As uh, they turn they right, if they had gone straight, they're on a wonderful bike path that takes them the shortcut across towards Torquay. And the facilities in this area are getting better and better for cycling. I wonder how much just the presence of Cadell Evans has influenced the local councils and shires in the creation of more support for cyclists, particularly recreational cyclists. Yeah, I would agree. He certainly put the area on the map because he lives here. He doesn't originate from here. He's a Northern Territory's right person, actually, before he came south. We've only ever seen him as a Victorian, though. Everybody around the country wants to claim him. Yeah. He was born in Catherine in the Northern Territory, spent some time in Armidale, New South Wales, and most of his teenage years were in Arthur's Creek in the outskirts of Melbourne in Victoria. Now... Well, although he's predominantly based in Europe, in Switzerland, he does have a home here in Bowen Heads. So the commissaire has just rolled up next to Georgia. What I presume uh, the message being told is that the gap is now one minute, uh, which usually means that the commissaire will OK their team vehicle uh, to drop in behind her and give her support. If not, they'll certainly send uh, the neutral car out there. If you look there's at a her... crash. There's a crash in the peloton, I'm hearing. There's a Trek rider down, and we'll see if we can get pictures of that for you. The peloton have livened themselves up here, and there it is. And it's a lot of riders involved. A number of the riders from the Virtue Cycling team. A former mm -hmm. Polish national champion has been caught up in it, number 83, Wielowska. Yeah, and Abby Snedden is down there near his camera. She was in the attacking moves a little bit earlier on. Uh, Jean Kudova, the Dutch girl, in the light green colours there. Molly Weaver is also there from the Trek Drops team. Two riders from that squad. Well, they look as though they're all getting slowly away from the scene, which is a good sign. But again, another disruption on the straight road when the field appeared to be reacting with high speed. And the response now coming from the peloton, that adds tension to the race. The advantage for our sole leader, Whitehouse, has now plummeted down towards the 45-second mark. This is Snedden trying to get herself going once again. It wasn't that long ago that we saw her attempting to force the breakaway. Yep. And the convoy of cars for them to try and leapfrog their way back to the peloton in is spread out a long way in front of them. This is one of the riders from the B Pink team who's trying to go away once again. And I wouldn't be surprised if this is Lisa Monzetti. 80 kilometres out from the finish. This is a tricky little road, this one now, for a while. There's nowhere to hide. Long, straight stretch of road, this, so you can be within sight even if you've got more than a one-minute advantage. So it makes it very difficult for the breakaway. Peloton, though, Cape, they've really slowed down. They have. The, the breakaway will certainly be strengthened. Uh, if we get two out in front, it's certainly a much stronger proposition for survival. Uh, with two riders than one. We can see Whitehouse looking over her shoulder as she rounds the corner. Likely a little bit buoyed by seeing somebody come across and help her with the efforts. Phil, look, take a look at her top tube there. You can see two cubes. You know what they are? They're actually gels. They're part of her race nutrition sitting right there on the top <laughs> tube. And maybe it's so that she doesn't uh, forget to eat, but certainly easy access. 
uh, there. We can just see the jelly globs. I think that's probably the technical term, jelly glob. I used to love those, Matt, but you can't eat them and commentate. It's a shame. She's about 13 kilometres from the spin point. That's a long way to stay in front. She's 63 seconds ahead now. This is Lisa Marzenti, who was out originally uh, on the early move, 10 kilometres into the race start itself. Now she's at it again. She was aggressive on Thursday, and there's no change on Saturday. At the front of the peloton, we can see riders in those bright colours of L.A. Cipollini. That's Swinkles, number 36, riding towards the front. Number three for the Mitchelton Scott team, that's the youngest rider on that team, Janelle Crooks. No pressure on Janelle Crooks today to perform for herself. Her responsibility is to look after Annemiek Van Vluten and Amanda Spratt. And sitting on the front of the field, as she has been uh, fairly consistently throughout the race, she's a bit of a lieutenant for today. Likely she's been asked to just sit there and patrol and make sure nothing dangerous gets away. She's almost the first responder of the team, if you will, to give the other riders, the protected riders, uh, Amanda Spratt and also Annemiek van Vloten. Don't forget Gracie Elvin. We haven't seen much of her this season racing, uh, but I know that she's certainly in a lot of form. The crash riders rejoining the back of the peloton. It just goes to show that the riders have taken the pressure off a little bit. The peloton starting to slow down the gap to the breakaway is going out somewhat we can see them a bit of freewheeling feel they're, they're certainly yeah. taking their time to take a deep breath get a little bit of recovery all the fallers took advantage everyone is back from that incident we saw now to the gap between our sole leader Whitehouse, to the peloton is at 111 112 now but uh, lisa morzenti the italian from b pink she's just 20 seconds behind or 28 seconds behind the front of the race Kate, if you could get into the earpiece of White House, what would your advice be at this point? It would be to ease off just 5 or 10% because help is coming. Uh, her best chance of survival today is absolutely to join forces with another rider. Uh, it will strengthen them. So it is worth sacrificing a little bit of advantage just to get that help. Uh, but Mozenti is tiring already. We can see her cadence has dropped. Her gear has increased. That's a sign of fatigue if ever I saw one as well as the hunched shoulders she's looking over her shoulder too it, it's, it's a dead giveaway when they start looking behind yeah. them because when you are on form you don't care if they're five meters off your wheel you still charge ahead uh, she's a bit unsure but she's kind of stuck uh, in no man's land peloton they don't look too interested no they might well open up a gap here look at it 123 now to the leader over the peloton and that is White House She's still got 11 kilometres to stay in front to get those first sprint points. Well, with that in mind, for the first of the intermediate sprint points in Torquay, does she wait for the Italian? Or does she try and make sure she gets the points by staying off the front on her own yeah. and then wait? Well, then, I, I guess that really goes to strategy for overall race. So if they're chasing uh, a jersey, some intermediate sprint points, and that is what they're after for the day. Absolutely, Georgia Whitehouse, you go, girl, because this is your opportunity uh, to stand on that podium and get some points in the MAPE sprint classification. She does look like she's not slowing down at all earlier. We did say that an indicator of how hard she was working was sitting up on the bars, but she's now out on the hoods and giving it a bit more stick, so to speak. This is the Italian... Morzenti, and you can see her body language. She can see the sole leader, Whitehouse, just yeah. around the corner with her following support car. 25 seconds, just a little kick out of that corner to get back on top of the gear and maintain the momentum. And she's going to get across. Uh, she's going to get across because the field at the moment have decided uh, to wait and see. And I think she'll get across in the next three kilometres. She's closing very quickly. Often when the athletes are in this position where they're stuck in no man's land, you break it down and you think five kilometers i can do this for five kilometers i'll just keep it steady and try and jump across we can see she is a bit fatigued but she'll get a lot of relief if she bridges over to white house and then the peloton can pay a little bit more attention if they are too out at front as we can see they're still rolling along they don't appear to be too interested i'm not surprised uh, two riders at this stage in the race that don't have massive cvs behind them they're probably not uh, a big threat, but the peloton would want to keep their eye on them. Almost out to two minutes for White House out in front yeah. as they're on Blackgate Road. And this is one of those roads that it looks flat, but as you're heading towards Torquay, it's ever so slightly uphill. Only around about a 1% gradient. A false but it, flat. But it's enough. 
a false flight can burn the heck out of the legs, uh, especially in this midsection of the race. And often you don't even realise the damage that's being done until you try and accelerate up a climb or through a sprint. And your legs are a little bit dead. And there's the other end of that bike path that we alluded to oh. earlier on. They could have taken the shortcut. Absolutely. I'm glad we found that. There's the sweep. They've turned completely off just at this minute in time, waiting for somebody to do a counter move because we've got two minutes now, which is good to see. Taking full advantage of the lull in the peloton. They're coming together, these two cannot be too far away. She hasn't wasted a lot of energy, this woman here, Whitehouse, pedaling low gears, sitting up nicely. And her high cadence is an indicator of relative freshness. Uh, she takes on some water bottles from neutral support there. It's important uh, to stay hydrated while you're out there, Phil. We've seen that she's, you know, got food on the mind on her top tube. She's now taking on hydration. All those things start to wear at the back end of the race if you don't pay attention early. Well, Chloe Hosking, speaking before the race got underway, she said it's a race in two, this one. The opening battle in the crosswind and then trying to survive the climbs. She expected that to be the case today, even though it is almost dead still here in Geelong. It hasn't eventuated, much to everybody's surprise. As we look at the Italian Lisa Monzetti in the classic time trial position now, Kate. She looks a bit more comfortable than she did. Her cadence has increased. She went through a tough patch a few kilometres ago. I would suggest that she can see uh, Georgia Whitehouse in her immediate view now and that spurred her on to just make that last minute effort to get across. And perhaps in her mind. <laughs> yeah. Georgia, I'm just here. Why won't you wait for me? <laughs> well, we haven't seen Georgia look around uh, for quite a number of kilometres now. She did before she turned that corner, uh, but I think team directions were to truck on um, somewhat and really head into that sprint which is at the 66 kilometre mark, so nine kilometres away from her. But Mozenti's just behind. This will give them both a bit of a little bit of recovery and a little bit more chance to uh, to defend that break. It's out to a couple of minutes. The peloton don't seem too interested. But what we really want to see is these pair come together, work together, give each other a little bit of recovery. Quite different riding styles between them. Georgia Whitehouse, very high cadence, very fluid, very efficient way of riding, especially on roads like this. Well, she's a very, very good peddler. So much so, I begin to think her gears are stuck. Well, she'd be a good track rider. Yeah. This There's is an nasty little. It's a bad. Yeah. It's, a, it's an example of this road that I alluded to earlier on. It's got these nasty little drags in it. And yeah. I'm sure that you've ridden this road quite a few times, Phil. Yeah, with the I was of time never at the front, so here. I never saw the climbs. Very clever. I was always at the back. Cagey. Cagey. I, I could feel the pressure on my legs, though. Well, we can see from this shot that it is slightly uphill. We, I'm not sure that there's a Strava climb segment uh, going up here, but it's certainly wear on the legs. Both of the riders are within striking distance there for Morzenti to get up to White House. White House isn't waiting for her, uh, but I think she'll be happy when she gets there. This small airfield that you can see off of the left-hand side, they do a lot of skydiving from out of there. I've had the privilege of jumping out of a perfectly good aeroplane from that airfield. Then what do you jump out for? Because <laughs> it was my 30th birthday and my oh. wife had updated the life insurance. OK. <laughs> Tiger Moth World. Ride is now not too far away from Torquay, about eight kilometres. And the director in the car for the Staminade Sydney Uni team is Joanne Hogan, and she was a very uh, impressive cyclist herself. She retired only a season ago, and she's now imparting her knowledge on the young riders. She's pumped. She's really excited to have a young group of ladies to mentor and teach the craft to. And can I say, she's doing a pretty tremendous job. They've got some real talent in that team, and under her guidance, I think that we will see some really big gains made uh, by some of the young riders. What Joanne is making sure that the Sydney University Stamina team do is have an impact on the race. Joanne was a silver medalist at the Australian Championships around that torturous course at Mount Buninyong. And they're a team that don't have a big favourite to win. So they're shaping the race.
the team officials just checking in, letting her know the status of what's happening out on course. Checking in to see if she's okay. She's not hesitating. She went over and had a chat to them, but she's certainly not slowing down. The instructions certainly weren't white. Um, and if they were, she just flat out ignored it because she's really powering ahead. They've got eight kilometres now to go, seven kilometres into this first intermediate sprint. She's sucking back some big breaths there. She's working very hard. Yeah, there's no waiting. 18 seconds is her advantage over Lisa Morzenti, the Italian who's doing the chasing. Back to the peloton. They're now at two and a half minutes behind. And not too motivated to go anywhere from the looks of it. Team Tibco uh, on the front there in the blue jersey with the yellow and blue stripe. Team Virtue Racing with former world time trial champion Linda Willemson at the front on the left there. And Ale Cipollini just patrolling. Chloe Hosking, their sprinter, the Australian. Seeing the Tipco team at the front with the bright yellow helmets on and that stripe of blue across their chest, seeing them on the front, how much does that tell you about the confidence that they've got in their new recruit, Shannon Molsey, the Australian champion? Well, Shannon Molsey deserves their support, Phil. They do. And in fact, Team Tipco have never raced in Australia before in their lives. The whole team coming here for the first time. They were down in South Australia, now they're here. And their first victory of the year was Shannon Malseed winning the national title. And for the first year, the team are coming to see her. So they've had a wonderful trip so far. And don't be surprised to see them in the action. Well, it clearly caught them ever so slightly off guard because throughout the Tour Down Under for Shannon Malseed, she had to wear a jersey that was used as the presentation jersey when she won the Australian Championships with sticky tape over various sponsors that weren't consistent with the sponsors of her trade team, which is Tipco Silicon Valley Bank. Well, she's very happy to be out there, uh, sans gaffer tape <laughs> on the jersey, and the kit looks fantastic. Annemiek van Vloten coming to the front, another This mechanical. is the leader of mechanical problem for Whitehouse. So Morzetti, the Italian chasing, will not only get across, but she might go out in front. Oh, this is devastating. The, the mecha this is interesting. The mechanic's out of the car, but there's no wheel support. There was no communication early in anticipating. That's a lack of experience from Whitehouse. She's had a rear wheel puncher, and clearly the team wasn't aware of what was happening. This is a disaster. This is really a disaster for Whitehouse. She's worked so hard out on course. Uh, both herself and the team have had, oh, I'd like to say, a little bit of a shocker there. As Morzenti well. has just ridden straight past her. She needs to get back on the bike. And now she finds herself chasing. Well, that's a real shame. But that was unfortunately a botched job. And she's now in second place. Still polite, though. As she got pushed off by the mechanic, she still had time to say, thank you. Oh, the last time I saw that happen was in 1978 in the Tour of Zambia, when oh. they called the rider back. Uh, because he hadn't said thank you to the mechanic. Well, there's never an excuse for bad manners, gents. Well, especially as this is a women's race and a top-class event at that. Georgia Three White. minutes is a big gap. It is a big gap. She needs to just maintain her composure. She might have a little bit of adrenaline running through her system. Uh, she remounts the bike. A few issues with the gears there, but she's in good hands. Shimano Neutral Service is sitting right next to her if that wheel causes her any problems. I'm Does sure. she run the risk of that little bit of panic and going too hard too soon once she gets rolling again? Oh, naturally, especially with that rush of adrenaline. I'd love to see her in a slightly heavier gear. The, the lower cadence, the higher cadence uh, is very efficient, but I think that she's quite a strong rider to get a break out to three minutes. She's proved that she does have the legs on. She's in the big chain ring, and I hope uh, that she can just compose herself, take a few deep breaths and get back up and form a twosome. We didn't see that coming, did we? We thought that Morzenti would duck across to her and they'd form uh, a pair that way. If Morzenti doesn't wait a bit for her here, I think that's a tactical error. Uh, between them, they have a lot of strength. One out, uh, not nearly as much. It'll be interesting to see how this pans out. Peloton's still not very interested. No, I think White House will cross that gap. It's not very far in front of the to Mozanti now, so we'll see. This is the peloton still deciding what to do with the day. 71 kilometres out, still a long way, and the roads get much more difficult as well. Gonna, but if they give, if they hit four minutes, they're giving themselves quite a target. 
the leaders of the race. They're just on four and a half kilometres away from the first of the intermediate sprints in the race for the MAPAI sprint classification. That first sprint is in Torquay. Two riders away, two and a half minutes. That's updated. We're closer to three and a half minutes, according to our GPS tracker. And the Wiggle High Five team milling towards the front. The riders have been out on course for 45 odd kilometres, an hour, just over an hour and 10 minutes into the race. That shows us that's a pretty high average speed, 45 kilometres in an hour 10. So while the pictures make it look like the peloton are taking it pretty easy, actually they're ticking along at quite a speed. Lisa Morzenti, she's looking around wondering what happened uh, to Georgia White. She's waiting. Here she's she a, comes. She's about to find out. She can ask her in person now. Well, two's better than one, that's for sure. Three and a half minutes a lead as they come together. Four kilometres out from the sprint. A little bit of a welcome party for her there. Yeah, all I could hear was from White House was, oh, OK. <laughs> Perhaps Morzenti was saying, you can do a turn now. Oh, OK, OK. <laughs> they need to share the workload up here. If only one of them takes responsibility for the pace, that is a recipe for disaster. I expect to see them swapping quite even turns. I hope that White House, as a slightly more inexperienced rider, doesn't take too much responsibility, but a nice little flick of the elbow there to get Morzenti to take up the speed, take up the pace. Almost looks as if they're teammates, and they'll be riding as if they're teammates for quite a while. But the Italian at the front, she rides for the B Pink squad. The Australian at the back of the group, it's Sydney Uni Stamine. Who's got a B pink, pink socks? They're they almost pink. have matching jerseys. They'll get down to a Tina section here at a roundabout and they'll make a right hand turn. Then they'll be alongside the beach in Torquay before they head through to the first of our intermediate sprints, which is three and a half kilometres away. Three points for the winner, two for second place, one for third place. Great opportunity for one of these two if they can. Obviously, they'll get the sprint here in Torquay. Then if they can hold on all the way through to series, which is with just 15.8 kilometres to go, one of them may well get themselves a moment in the spotlight at the podium presentation at the end of the race. Undeservedly so. If that's to be the way it is, we've gone over three minutes a game. We've had about 3.10. The disruption has gone by now, so reclaiming the ground they want really quite long turns each pushing the pace give the other one chance to recover and then go back forward they must work together with so far to go to the finish three kilometers to the sprint this looks like the outskirts of torquay to me matt yeah this is the right hand turn and then it's onto the esplanade which takes them into the heart of torquay famous for its many surf shops rip curl rip curl having started here in Torquay and it's grown significantly Torquay over the last 10 years is the peloton just cruising along as the two breakaway riders White House at the front Morzenti in second position make the right hand turn onto the Esplanade nice crowd welcoming the two leaders now they've come together in the last two kilometers it's a really humid day today, as well as being quite warm now. It's supposed to hit a high of 30 degrees, which is about 94 degrees Fahrenheit. For those that can work it out. And here's a look at where they are on the course map. Once they get through Torquay, they then head past number one Great Ocean Road as they head past the Torquay Golf Course. And then a little bit further along, they make the left-hand turn heading down towards Bells Beach for the first of the Subaru Queen of the Mountains points. Yeah, that's a tough road, and that's where the whole situation could change when we get down towards Bells Beach. But look how they pushed on here. Nearly half a minute gain in a kilometre. Well, Mozenti is back pushing quite a high gear and lower cadence. It's working for her so far, but that will add to a bit of cumulative fatigue as they keep going. Georgia Whitehouse doesn't look quite as composed as she did earlier. Not surprising. It'll take her a bit of time to recover uh, from that effort, both physically and emotionally. It can be quite rattling when something like that happens uh, so unexpectedly uh, out on course, especially when you're in a breakaway situation. But they're out to nearly three and a half minutes. That's a solid gap. I can honestly say I did not expect the gap to get that far out. 
Um, but it's a great animator for the race because as this keeps going on, if these riders uh, continue to move that advantage further out, it'll take some real aggression from back in the field from the big teams that everybody is watching. Well, there's an elephant on a trailer. And it's an African elephant as well, so it's a long way from that home. That was just for you, Phil. It must have been, yeah. And based on the size of the years, yes. which are bigger than the Asian <laughs> elephants. Yes. But if these riders uh, maintain their advantage or even grow up, Mitchelton, Scott, everybody will be looking to them uh, to take up the chase. Also, Cordament, the real estate national team, uh, with Kat Garfoot, Tiff Cromwell, Rachel Nalen, Loretta Hanson, Peter Mullins, they've got an incredible team. They will also be looked at to take some responsibility to bring this back. With roughly 1,500 metres to go before they get to the intermediate sprint point. And the beach, the left-hand side, it's really calm, the waters at this point in Torquay. The beach for surfing is a little bit further around the corner, one kilometre to the sprint. Lawn bowls off to the right-hand side. I wonder they'll sprint. They, they will. Sprint. No, they'll sprint. Absolutely, they'll sprint. Because the word. even if they're out to a five-minute gap, I'm backing the peloton to win. I don't see either of these riders standing any chance of surviving no. off the front, so they have to go for the intermediate sprint. This will be a serious battle. Okay. We'll watch what we get. I think Whitehouse will be very motivated. Her team appeared to be instructing her to go for this sprint. They both look a bit more fatigued than they did 10 kilometres ago. Not surprising. That's what happens uh, throughout the bike race. Tactical game already starting, Kate. Yeah, Whitehouse won't take up responsibility for the pace. They're a little bit of cat and mouse here. That will be an advantage. Uh, but if the name of the game for Whitehouse and the Sydney Uni Staminate team is to get these points, then she's doing the right thing. And this is smart by Whitehouse. She clearly is also of the view that they're not able to survive to the finish, and they're almost coming to a grinding halt. It's like a sprint on the track, Phil. It is, and it's just losing time. So they're putting, as you said, a lot of uh, credence on the sprint point. There's one point difference between this the two. Crazy this is quite silly, seen. frankly. Then Rear wheel oh. skid then from Morzenti, and now the sprint opens up. The Italian kicks hard for the line. This is a battle for three points in the race for the Map A sprint prize. Whitehouse, who initiated the breakaway, she's trying to go around the outside. Morzenti is still holding on. Whitehouse is coming over the top, and it is Whitehouse who will get the points, and she'll take the lead in the race for the Map A sprint prize. That was a big battle. Well, I have to say, that's one of the most bizarre intermediate sprints yeah. in a road race that I've ever seen. I was going to say Georgia Whitehouse needed to lay off Morzenti a bit because when you're sprinting from the back, you want to lay off and jump at them and not have it come to a standstill like that. It did end up uh, playing in Whitehouse's favour, but that's very bizarre and, and actually that's shattered the confidence that each will have in the other uh, to push ahead as essentially teammates in this break, a little pat on the back. Let's get going again. Yeah, that was just plain old bizarre, Matt. But very mature. But very mature from the 20-year-old Italian, Morzenti, to get on with the job. OK, we both understand the significance of that battle. Now let's start cooperating again. Well, just looking from the helicopter here, which is about a thousand feet up, maybe a little bit lower than that. Low cloud coming in. We had this problem yesterday. I had a helicopter flight yesterday. And in fact, we couldn't fly over the bay because the cloud was extremely low with the heat. It was from Gumbaya Park you made the trip from, wasn't it? Uh, to and from, from Barwon Heads, yes. You had and, the chance uh, to watch Esteban Chavez go surfing. Yeah, and uh, grab a koala and play with a carpet python. Yeah, he didn't like snakes, by the way. This is Gina Ricardo in the pink colours of the Sydney Uni Staminate team. She'll be pretty pleased to hear that her teammate has managed to win the points out in front. The Japanese national champion up alongside her as well for the Wiggle High Five team. And that is Iri Yonamina. There is still the third place points to be gained here. I don't expect them to be contested as hotly as if they were going for the first second and third sprint of course but it wouldn't surprise me to see Nettie Edmondson jump out of the pack and go for that or even Chloe Hosking test her legs 
here's another look at the sprint in the race for the MAPI sprint classification. One of the key moments, though, was the rear-wheeled skid from Morzenti to try and get Whitehouse to do the lead-out. But Whitehouse, she kept her cool. She stayed in the slipstream of the Italian, and then she calmly collected the points. Quite a ding-dong battle for the sprint in the end. We knew that they'd be interested in contesting it and not just roll through as part of their breakaway possibly not how it didn't play out quite as we had imagined but georgia whitehouse well she took a thumping victory there would have given her a lot of confidence and a great piece of recognition uh, for the team they've done a lot of hard work out there today and a super crowd too in torquay so all getting momentum for the men's race which will come through here as well on sunday 335 the gap they're sort of getting it back quite uh, quickly could be a good sprint here for the third place not knowing quite what will happen on the way through there's three sprint points which includes the actual finish uh, what's 50 euros because that was the prize for winning that sprint not a lot no that's true that hasn't helped at all really no around <laughs> about 75 australian dollars enough to buy a round of coffees uh, for everybody tomorrow morning <laughs> after they go for their little recovery roll and just going through the front there, that intermediate sprint, it was a little bit difficult to tell from the aerial shot, but it certainly was a rider from the LA Cipollini team that was leading them through. I know who it wasn't. Roxanne Kinnedeman, after that horrible fall that happened earlier on on the road between Geelong and Barwon Heads. Always disappointing to see riders failed, especially so early in a race, only 10 kilometres in. But it shows you have to be vigilant from kilometre one from the get-go. Now, two breakaway riders still working well together. Georgia Whitehouse with her hand in the air. Another flat tyre we're hearing. Gosh, she's, can... had a, she's had a day of very mixed fortunes with this breakaway, and now a second wheel change needed. Tell you what, I hope that it uh, goes a bit more smoothly than the last one. Asking for some ice. I just heard from their team car a big sigh. Oh, her back tyre is flat. You probably can't believe the day of misfortunes happening. She's taking uh, some ice on board in the back of her jersey. Perhaps her tyre isn't flat. She continues uh, to ride on. And we haven't seen neutral service uh, come up just yet, but that's something to watch. It's an indicator of how hot it is out on the road when she's putting and requesting ice down the back of her jersey. Um, I think she's getting herself into the unknown here now. Georgia Whitehouse, I think she's feeling the pace. Well, the two leaders, they've made the left-hand turn. They're heading towards Bells Beach. They've gone through the first of the intermediate sprints. Let's now head down to Robbie McEwen. Well, guys, I would estimate that this uh, breakaway duo, I think they would have lost themselves around 30 to 40 seconds with that, what they call, surplusin, uh, before the sprint almost coming to a standstill. It's quite interesting to watch. But even the, the lack of organisation about even getting together, Georgia Whitehouse was off the front and I actually spoke to her team director who said, well, this really wasn't the plan. She was our designated protected rider and uh, she was to sit in and try on the circuit, but um, things have panned out differently. She went on the attack, but then she wasn't willing to wait for Morzenti to come across. She wanted to go to this sprint on her own. Then she was forced to, well, wait for an away with the puncture, which didn't go smoothly at all, as you, as you would have seen. Now that they are together, they're finally starting to work properly together. But just a little while back, I did drop back in uh, the convoy of the cars and have a very quick chat to the team director of uh, Ale Cipollini. There's uh, Fortunato Laquaniti, and he told me that Roxanne Kinnedeman also hit her head, so she's been taken to hospital with a concussion, and uh, she'll be having some scans. But she was conscious and fine and talking, but um, she did hit her head quite hard as well. Well, fingers crossed for Roxanne Kinnedeman. Robbie, back to that intermediate sprint. We've seen you involved in some vigorous ones, throwing headbutts to the likes of Baden Cook and Stuart O'Grady. But have you ever seen an intermediate sprint like that, where the breakaway almost came to a grinding halt? No, I haven't. I've never myself come into an intermediate sprint going that slow. Uh, it was quite something to watch. It was like I was uh, watching racing on the track with the two full track sprinters trying to force each other to the front but uh, Georgia Whitehouse was clearly quicker good jump by Morzenti initially 
but she did jump from around 300 metres to go. So Whitehouse just, yeah, picked up that slipstream quite easily up and over the top. And I just saw her before when she dropped back to a 10 car. Huge grin and a big thumbs up. She's very happy that she got that intermediate sprint. And now they're starting to work smoothly together. The problem is they're now coming onto the hilly part of the course, up the hill out of Torquay, and pretty shortly they'll be turning left to drop down towards Bells Beach. A couple of those big roller coaster hills that'll really start to shorten them up. And then, of course, the first QOM, Queen of the Mountain of the Day. And uh, I think that's where they'll start to struggle. But at the moment, they're putting everything in it, into it and working smoothly together, finally. Robbie, how does the wind look out on course? Because so far, we really haven't seen it play much of a role at all. It's as good as non-existent, Kate. The wind is really so weak and at, at times there is not a breath of wind the good news out here at the moment because we're right out next to the coast that it is a little bit cooler earlier towards the start uh, back towards geelong it was almost 30 degrees but now if i look on the thermometer of the motorbike i'm sitting on it's just ticked up to 27 because we've headed inland a little bit next to the water it was only 25 degrees so that is a little bit of relief for these riders Thanks, Robbie. We'll get back to you throughout the race as our two leaders are off the front with an advantage of 2 minutes and 50 seconds. The leaders are Georgia Whitehouse, the Australian riding for Sydney Uni Staminade, along with the Italian Lisa Morzenti, who rides for the B Pink team. Back in the peloton, everybody's still looking very calm and relaxed. And with those two riders out in front, I'm convinced the peloton are not concerned about them at all. I think they'll implode on this series of rollers that we get now heading out through Bells Beach. Uh, I think Georgia, uh, number 125, Georgia Whitehouse, is appearing good from behind, but if you see her face, uh, I think she's pretty much into the red zone. And not far away from that Queen of the Mountain point at Bells Look Beach. at the road, Matt. Look at this horrible road now. Oh, this will sap the strength. It saps your morale, and then your strength follows. It can be a bit demoralising, especially when the legs are hurting and the lungs are burning to look ahead and see that series of rollers. What it does give you is little pockets of recovery because on those long, flat, pulse flat roads, you don't get a single moment's recovery. You stop pedalling for a second and you wipe out all your speed. So it will be some nice moments of recovery, but I'm afraid these little rollers will bite them. Uh, on the other side, the kilometre 58 is where the QOM starts. So just a few K to go. Quite smart there by the young Italian Morzenti, number 75. As they were over the big dippers, she did all she could to maintain that momentum before it started going uphill. And White House is really starting to suffer a little bit. She's dropped down. She's in her drops. I'm not sure uh, she's there for any other reason than she's starting to hurt a bit. She'll be enjoying the recovery on these downhill sections, but that... That recovery will be short-lived as they nip up this next little roller before they head on to quite a challenging first KOM. This one's a lot more difficult than the previous one that they went over. This one goes for around about 500 metres, the next one that they hit, and they'll be down onto the small chain ring pretty soon. This is a nasty little climb. Well, they've done an exceptional job so far to stay out, get the advantage out to three and a half minutes. It's back just below two and a half minutes now. It's definitely coming back. If they can survive to the KOM, which I think they will, the QOM, then I think after that we're going to see the peloton in view very quickly. The peloton will climb up that QOM significantly quicker than this breakaway. Uh, they're quite fatigued after being out there for quite a number of you know, clicks now. Georgia Whitehouse still maintaining the pace. They're both suffering a bit. The body language, you can see, Phil, look at that bouncing, ducking shoulders from the Italians starting to hurt. Yeah. It is, and when they cross the QOM at the top, they are precisely half distance in the race, so you see still an awful long way to go. That in itself, I think, will be slightly demoralising. You can actually see on White House's head stem that uh, she has the course um, mapped out there with all the indicators written there, so she'll know exactly how far it is to go. You can see those rollers up ahead of the peloton. They're still not moving too quickly, but naturally their speed down and up will be faster than the breakaways. Number one and number two, former winners of the race, Anna just McVan Vluten and Amanda Spratt sitting, relaxed, comfortable at the rear of the peloton. They're just hanging out back there. They don't need to worry too much now. They just need to pay a little bit of attention 
uh, in the case that any attacks do go over the QOM from any riders of any danger. But they'll have one or two Mitchelton Scott riders at the front patrolling um, and ensuring that if any movements are made, that they are represented. Seeing them at the back tells us a big part of the story of the day, the lack of wind. If it was windy, they wouldn't be sitting down towards the back because that's the danger zone. But when it's as calm as it is today, they can afford to relax towards the back, almost at the top of the hill. There's the crest just in front of them. They make a left-hand turn, then they sweep down along the right with Bells Beach, famous Bells Beach, off to the left-hand side, and then they start the vicious queen of the mountain climb. Well, as we can see from the course profile and the elevation, the first half of the race is the easy part. Uh, so they've got quite a number of rollers and climbs to go. This first QOM is only the very beginning of that. And whether the athletes animate the race through their tactics and uh, aggressive attacks doesn't really matter. I think there's a there's a lot of natural selection that happens just by way um, of the course. It's very self-selective, Phil. And you can see the, the roller coasters here now. We're going into the hilly sector the whole race. It all happens in the last 50% of the course and the peloton know this and yet they've never allowed this breakaway to get more than just over three and a quarter minutes. So there's no way they can stay away to the finish. 60 kilometres remaining. The Queen of the Mountain point after they go past Bells Beach, that's at 56.6 kilometres to go. So they are approaching that point. If they were to make the left-hand turn in a few hundred metres, they'd be into the car park down to Bells Beach. Back of the peloton, number 136, so you can see out of the saddle. That's Peter Mullins for the Cordamenta real estate team. Australian national squad. Peter herself, a former Australian road champion. She's got one of the big favourites for the race today. Katrin Garfoot, along with Lauren Kitchen, also a former winner of the race on that team, Rachel Nalen. Kate, at what point do the teams that don't have a really quick sprinter, but they think they've got one of the favourites, at which point do they start to really light the action up? Well, I think now that we're in, we're heading into the second half of the race, the, the self-selective course will play in their favour a lot. They do need to start applying a lot of pressure over all of these uh, little rollers. It'll certainly make a very big impact just on reducing the field to a more manageable size. In years past, we've seen the group come back down to about 20 or 30 riders, which means that the, the, the big teams with the higher numbers certainly have a much higher advantage for now the breakaway is still hanging on. They've got a couple of minutes up their sleeve, but that is being reduced fairly quickly. Peloton is starting to string out. They've picked the pace up a little bit. They will see the QOM as a big turning point. It's the halfway mark in the race. It's also the mark that says the course is getting a little bit more difficult. We saw Kate Perry just hanging out at the back before. She's one of the best domestic climbers we have, riding for specialised women's racing. They have a great collaboration this year, uh, Matt, with Black Sheep, an Australian-based clothing company that do some really funky stuff. And together, uh, they've worked hard at really building the team up that next level. All the riders exceptionally well supported. And uh, they've got some great staff that elevate them to the level of an international team, even though currently they're only a domestic one. They do have a very strong team. Look out for Kendall Hodges, Taryn Heather, and also Kate McElroy from that specialised women's racing team. And Kate Perry, who Kate had just mentioned. There's Bells Beach off to the left-hand side. And one Antonio Fletcher, the great Spanish cyclist who was a stage winner at the Tour de France back in 2003. He's down here for the Cadell Evans Great Ocean Road Race. It's his first visit, much to my surprise, to Australia. Has never ridden the Tour Down Under. But when we see him at the compound at the Tour de France, we see him just scooting through the compound on his skateboard. He didn't bring his skateboard with him, but he did hire a surfboard, and he went and ventured into the waves at Bells Beach just yesterday. He's not afraid of the sharks, it appears. No. He really did enjoy himself, and it's great to have one Antonio Fletcher with us at this year's Cadell Evans Great Ocean Road Race. There's the car park down at the beach, which is a hub of activity on the Labor Day weekend in early March for the Rip Curl Classic. Now you see, looking at this road from a helicopter, if it had been hostile weather today, this field would have just split up all over the place. As it is, they're waiting for these roller coaster hills. When they go over these roller coasters, it's not so much the pace is on, it's a lot of the women at the back 
simply aren't up to the effort and being the driving at the front is, is hurting. It felt like there was a little bit of movement within the peloton on that occasion, Kate, as these are the numbers for the climb. Maximum gradient of 18%, two kilometres in length, but a few in the peloton that have been sitting at the back figure not sure what's going to happen up here past Bells Beach. I bet it'd be near the front. As Phil mentioned, there's two ways in which races break up. A breakaway goes off the front, uh, or the pace is just consistent enough that a lot of riders start dropping off the back. If you're a rider that is a good climber, you don't want to be anywhere near the riders who aren't, because for every time they drop a wheel, which is to say lose some contact and lose some distance from the wheel in front of them, it, may, it means you have to put in that extra effort uh, to rejoin and to bridge, and it's completely wasted energy. Strategically, it's just not very on point, and they need to be very careful about that. The riders with more experience, we will see them jostling and moving up. It's quite difficult. We can see the peloton spread the entire way across the road here, so it's tough to move up. It's not about pace. It's simply about, you know, are you willing to stick your elbow into somebody to get through? That's how accidents happen on the edge of these roads with no gutters you, you have to really well, it's not quite taking your life into your hands but you have to be pretty gutsy and uh, take a deep breath and decide that it's worth it this is the time when it is because once they hit that climb gradients up to 18 percent that's pretty solid it may only average six percent but you don't want to get caught out on an 18 percent part dropping uh, a wheel and dropping some pace the breakaway is on the climb now a minute 40 ahead i expect over the top but that will be reduced further and further. I think the peloton will just eat into that uh, as they go up this climb. It lasts a couple of kilometres before they hit that QOM. This is the fourth edition of the Deakin University Kid 11's Great Ocean Road Race. Two leaders, they've been off the front for quite a while now. They made their move just on the outskirts of Barwon Heads. Sitting at the back of the group, number 125, that's the Australian Georgia Whitehouse. She won the intermediate sprint in Torquay. The young Italian, the 20-year-old, who celebrated her birthday just three days ago, Lisa Morzenti from the B Pink team, is the one who's setting the tempo out in front. Off in the distance, that's the Queen of the Mountain point in the race for the Subaru Queen of the Mountains jersey. 500 metres until they get there. A little bit of a dip before they hit the climb proper. Completely different complexion to the race from what we've seen in the first three editions of the Deakin University Kid 11's Great Ocean Road Race, where the wind has been a factor. It hasn't today. So that will make the final closing on the last climbs towards Geelong even more explosive. How tactical will this climb be? The sprint was tactical. Well, Mozenti certainly showed her acceleration when they went to nearly snail's pace. They, ne they nearly stopped dead. It's the most bizarre thing I've seen in an intermediate sprint. Robbie McEwen, too, I'm glad that he uh, also backed that up and said we haven't seen anything like it. On the climb, well, gosh, I think they'll be going snail's pace simply because of the gradient um, of the climb. But Georgia Whitehouse, I reckon she'll be going for the points, Matt, because... You she know, wants she the knows. points, and now she goes. Georgia Whitehouse, she makes her move. Can Morzenti respond? No, the Italian does not have the answers. So one of the riders from the Sydney Uni Stamina team that was designated to be a protected rider, she ignored those early instructions. She's got herself into the breakaway. She's won the intermediate sprint in Torquay. She wins the Queen of the Mountains points at Bells Beach, but the peloton now is really closing in and a minute and nine seconds behind. White House collecting three points in the race for the Subaru Queen of the Mountains classification and she's almost spent all her biscuits. <laughs> yes, yeah, she looks cooked like a roast dinner. That was a lot of effort. Uh, important for their team tactics. I think that it's fair to assume that they would not have survived uh, too much further. So for White House, it was important to get those points. And in the race for the Subaru Queen of the Mountains jersey, on this climb, three points for the win. But on Shalamba Crescent, it's five points for the win. So who wins that Queen of the Mountains jersey? It's more likely to come down to that final climb. I've been really impressed to see the domestic talent uh, step up and you know, make the international field pay attention it certainly animated the race so far the peloton they don't look like they're making too many attacks the the gradient of the climb feel will just naturally self-select some riders will drop off the back but there's no attacks going up here and no team taking responsibility for it 
No, and the tail is very tidy of this peloton, so there's nobody really under pressure either, which I'm a little bit surprised on this climb. I thought there were quite a few weak riders down there. Seemingly not. One more place to come on the Queen of the Mountains. Incidentally, uh, Roxanne Kinnett, when we saw fourth my bike, the latest news from the hospital is she's in a stable condition, but she's passing in and out of consciousness, so they're just trying to uh, stabilise her, but it's basically good news at the moment. That was uh, number 61, Eva Berman from the Netherlands. She's gone across the top of that Queen of the Mountains points to collect the third place. That gives her one point in the race for the Subaru Queen of the Mountains classification. Well, this breakaway is shattered now. Morzenti struggled up for QOM, but now it's Georgia Whitehouse who is paying the price for that effort. They're no longer a twosome, Phil. They're just one after the other. Yeah. This will get swallowed up fairly quickly from the peloton. Yeah, the Italian up front here, she's been beaten to second place twice. So they're not really helping each other. And at a minute 14, it won't be long before they decide to pick them up. They may just leave them out there to fry for a bit longer. It's a cruel little game they play, isn't Oh, it's a nasty sport. <laughs> <laughs> and unfortunately for the two leaders who have really made the race so far, if they do get reeled in within the next 15 kilometres or so, which I suspect they probably will, they won't make it to the intermediate sprint in series to try and collect that map eye sprint classification. And they certainly won't survive until the climb of Chalamba Crescent. So I fear for Georgia Whitehouse, number 125, she'll finish in second place in each of those classifications. But I have to give her a very big high five for her efforts today. At Agreed. the beginning oh, yes. of the race, we did not, it was not a name we expected uh, to see to be one of the major protagonists early on. So well done uh, to her and the team. And I hope that her teammates have been taking advantage of the hard work, sitting back, resting their legs so that when the break does come back, that they will still be able to be represented. Uh, when some of the bigger teams, Mitchelton Scott and uh, Cordometha Real Estate National Team, they're the riders that we expect over the more difficult second half of the race. Here's a look at the Subaru Queen of the Mountain sprint between White House number 125 and Morzenti number 75. It was the Australian again who took that second spot so she kept her rival within her sights. The move came on the right hand side and Morzenti didn't have any answer to White House who has collected three points in the race for the Queen of the Mountains classification. Three points for her, two points then for Morzenti and one point for Berman. Our two leaders now find themselves at just over one minute ahead of the peloton and they've got themselves working together once again as we're inside the last 55 kilometres in the fourth edition of the Deakin University Kid Elevens Great Ocean Road Race. One minute ten, 70 seconds now, that's all it is. But at least we've spoken about two women we've never spoken about before, and they've taken the race to the superstars today, who haven't been able to make a move. Their names are well known to the rest of the peloton, and it's been due to the conditions, uh, very calm conditions, the calmest I have ever seen here, and this is the fourth year of this event. They're going to stick to the guns for the moment, because very often they start to close in. Now we're over the climb, there's always a chance they'll be allowed to run again but the next sprint point is 15 kilometers from the finish and the next climb is only nine kilometers from the finish it's unlikely they'll hit those two spots they really are toying with them now the brake's gone slightly out again the peloton has completely taken the foot off the accelerator after they went over that qom we saw a few gaps appearing but the riders are dropping back now to get some drinks and some food before they get in earnest into the back end of the race. They have passed through the halfway mark. And we can see three Sydney Uni Staminade riders just sitting at the back there, definitely taking advantage of the hard work being done out the front by teammate Georgia Whitehouse. Tipco Colours just rolling off the front as we see the rider with the blue helmet on in the quarter Mentha Real Estate Australian National Team Colours. That is Loretta Hansen. She's the youngest member of that Australian national team. She's not a rider that I expect to get the opportunity to race for herself today. As we just get confirmation for the Bells Beach Queen of the Mountains point, 
And it was Alice Cobb, in fact, that went over the top in third position. She'd broken clear of the peloton to collect those points. It was Berman that led the peloton over the top from the Trek Drops team. But it was the rider from the Tipco team and actually that was out in front. Our cameras just unfortunately hadn't quite picked it up. Alice Cobb of Great Britain taking the one point there. And for Tipco, both, both the woman and the team never been here before. So they found the way to Bells Beach. That's where we are at the moment. We've come away from Bells Beach now. We're starting to go inland as we turn uh, towards Geelong. Not an easy road now, virtually until we get to the outskirts of the city. And of course, very difficult, just nine kilometres out from the finish up Chalambra Crescent, which is a brute of a climb. And that is probably the reason why the main field has not reacted to these two. 78 seconds. So they've pushed on again. They're trying to recover, though, the best part of two and a half minutes. I've been really impressed with number 75, who's just 20 years of age, one of the youngest in the race, Morzenti. Yeah. She's been in second position at the sprint in Torquay, the coin of the mountain at Bells Beach. But each time after that, she has been the one that's got them organised again and continuing to yeah. try and hold on to what really is a very slender lead. A minute and 21 seconds. Not afraid of reputation to torch. She was the first woman to attack. She attacked some nine kilometres into the race. They let her dangle, then they came out and got her. Then she came across to the leader, Whitehouse, on her own. A uh, little bit surprised how she caught her because Whitehouse was standing on the roadside with a problem. But they've got back together again. It's been just for the breakaway riders for Georgia Whitehouse. Quite an animated day, mixed fortunes. She's had a flat tyre, she's spent a lot of kilometres solo, she's gotten a QOM title, she's gotten a sprint title. She might lose them through uh, the points accumulated at the next two. Uh, but for now, they're still surviving. The gap's going out further, we're playing a few games, the peloton with the mat. Two ways to take a look at the gap. One with the tag Hoyer, one minute and 26 second gap. Or we can take advantage of the chopper and take a look at the gap. And it's the old cliche in cycling, Kate. On a road like this, there's nowhere to hide. So the peloton, whether they can see the 128 or not, what the gap is, they can see the cars behind the breakaway. Well, they know they've got them under control. That's a beautiful shot. It gives a really good perspective. Uh, of the distance. It's quite hard to visualise what a minute and a half looks like. Well, there you go. There you have it on one long open road. The peloton can just see them up there. They're, they're toying with them. Uh, but the breakaway have done a tremendous job and they're, they're kicking on. They're not giving up. It's easy for us to sit here in commentary and say that they have no chance. Ladies, you've done an excellent job. We don't take away from that. Uh, we just know how incredibly difficult it is in these circumstances uh, with a peloton that will soon be starting to pay a little bit more attention and focus to the break. They're on the Great Ocean Road at the moment, but they're about to make the right-hand turn at this roundabout. If they had have gone off to the left and stuck with the Great Ocean Road, they'd be eventually down into Anglesey and then further along into Lawn, onto the likes of Wye River and Kennet River, before getting all the way down to Apollo Bay and eventually onto the famous 12 Apostles, which are down to around about six and a half Apostles now with corrosion. But it is a stunning place to visit. And if you do get the opportunity to come down to the surf coast, make the journey further along the Great Ocean Road. It's one of the most spectacular drives or rides you could ever imagine to do. Couldn't agree with you more there, Matt. It's the most beautiful ride. But it's not flat if you're thinking of taking a bicycle. It's quite oh, no. <laughs> The great Phil Anderson lives down towards I the know. end of the road in Apollo Bay. And I can recall one time doing a ride along the Great Ocean Road, about 20 kilometres away from where Phil Anderson lives. And here comes some guy running up the road with a dog alongside him. And it was the almost 60-year-old Phil Anderson. Turnaround point would have made for a 40k run. He's not slowing down. No, he's not slowing down. He's a tremendous athlete. Was the first uh, yellow jersey wearer of the Tour de France for Australia and um, my only problem going out with Phil on the bike he never stops talking and it's very difficult for me to talk on the Great Ocean Road. The art of a bike ride with Phil Anderson is ask short questions that require really long answers. <laughs> yes well he asks long questions and gets no answer in my case. <laughs> now the peloton about to make the right hand turn. They're very content aren't they Kate? 
relatively unusual circumstances when they take this right hand turn they're heading into a crosswind and this has been their small chance to recover before it gets tough they're not up against that today half their luck look it's at those trees not moving at all not an inch of wind out there matilda reynolds are riding as a guest rider here for holden team gusto she's sitting on the front she's reasonably new to cycling she comes from a triathlon background she's a very successful triathlete so it's a very uh, wise very smart choice by the Holden team to have her on board she will do great things for that team but Grace Brown is the rider to watch for them Brody Chapman uh, another young up-and-coming rider incredibly talented we saw over the summer and at the national championships she really made a mark and uh, put her name up there. That's the great thing about the Aussie summer, Matt, is that we, we get to see uh, this young talent really right taking on. the next step up. This summer's been wonderful for it. Shannon Molseed has been another one. Grace Brown, Brody Chapman, all these names that 12 months ago probably weren't on the list of uh, potential race winners, but they are this year. All those riders that you just mentioned with connections to the Holden Team Gusto squad, which we can see them now on the front. It's the black colours with the red on the sleeve. That's Reynolds, who's at the front, one of the guest riders on this team. For the last two years, they've won the National Road Series. And last year, it was Shannon Molseed who managed to take out that title. It was uh, Lisa Listen Hoskins the year before that. It's an impressive team that develops young riders in the same manner that we're seeing with what is now known as the Benelong team, the old Avanti team, the team that Richie Port came through. The Holden Gusto team is doing exactly the same for women's cycling. Well, and Holden have an incredible footprint in women's sport, actually, across cycling, across the AFL. They've really stepped up uh, to provide some equal opportunities uh, for women in sport in Australia, and we have to really applaud them uh, for that effort. And it's great to see a domestic team really mixing it with the internationals. There were two red bottles on the bike before. She's down to one as our leader, Georgia Whitehouse, is continuing to gnaw away, keep the calories and the fluids going in. And this is the woman that's keeping her company. This is Monzenti, the young Italian. To a degree, these two have recovered, you know. They're looking a lot better facially. They're not making the same expressions. They've got a nice rhythm going. And uh, Whitehouse hasn't increased her cadence. She's still settled down. Gap is being absolutely pinned at around about 90 seconds. And we are one hour and 10 minutes from the finishing line, which will put us absolutely on the schedule the organisers expected. So everything will go in according to plan just now. Well, the peloton has stepped up the pace. We've seen some attacks here. We've got four riders riding off the front. Number 63, we can see there is Annesley Park, rider number 46, Holly Breck, and they are joining two riders at the front number 33 Anna Trevisi from the Ale Cipollini team and Barbara Garisi from Virtue Cycling I expected Virtue to play a bigger role early on in the race in being aggressive she was one of the first to attack uh, oh. but they've been neutralized by that breakaway a little bit but look at what's happening here the, the chase is on in earnest yep. they're not even letting a small group jump away now Bill, this is the next phase of yeah. the race. Yeah, they, they've almost uh, metronomes because they, they realise they're 50 kilometres out. Time to bring it down, and they've got themselves organised just a little bit. A lot of head turning now to see who has reacted quickly to this because they, the names that we would expect to see making the final moves, like Van Vluten, Spratt, Malsey, perhaps Edmondson, will wait till the very last moment, but catching Garfoot may not. Just checking their locations, I can't see them. Those bright colours of the LA Cipollini team, Kate, they are marking the moves. They did this on the road in the Barwon Heads. They've marked them again as they head down Forest Road. They're trying to keep the race calm for Chloe Hosking. Chloe is noted as a sprinter. People run the risk of underestimating Chloe when there's a climb, like there is towards the end of the race today. She's been top five in this race before, and you do not want to go to a sprint finish with Chloe Hosking in contention. Oh, goodness, no. Uh, Chloe is she's very fit. She's uh, looking very firmly toward the Commonwealth Games, which, of course, we'll see free and live on Channel 7 here. Just in about eight weeks time and Chloe has her preparation nailed for that 
she can definitely get over the climb, Matt. I mean, it, it really, it's a matter for how the race goes into that. Look at some beautiful hay bale decorations. Where are we, Victoria or the south of France? This is wonderful. Anglesey, beautiful spot. I like the hay bale and the bike that has been put together nicely with the old milk crates. Not a particularly aerodynamic <laughs> position. It's Looks excellent. more like a mountain bike. That would rival anything the Tour de France has to offer, that one. A little bit wide handlebars, but we'll get away with it. White House from the uh, Sydney Uni Staminade team sitting at the back. She's now eaten both those tubes that were sitting on the top tube. No, she's still got one left, one to go. Late lunch, Morzenti in second position. They'll be hearing about the reactions coming from the peloton, but they cannot do anything about it. Fifty-two kilometres left to race. Well, that's what the clock says, Matt, but it seems to have stopped. We've been 52 kilometres for quite a long time now. Not good news for the two up front. And the next to the intermediate sprints, that's in series with just on 16 kilometres to go. And then the major obstacle of the day, the big opportunity for the non-sprinters, Jalamba Crescent, which comes, well, it starts with 10 k's to go. And there's a big change, 46.9 kilometres to go. So, Phil, time has jumped forward all of a sudden. Good news for the two ladies up front, a minute 25 the gap. It's been held, though, at the same time virtually. So at the moment, it's, it really is a case of cat and mouse here. And the pace has eased off again in the peloton. Nobody yet ready to take responsibility for the pace. I must say, I'm surprised at how patient uh, these major teams are being. I expected a flurry of attacks uh, to come through this section of the course. They're playing into the hands of the, the likes of Chloe Hosking. She can definitely get over the Shalamba Crescent climb if the pace is easy enough leading in and allows her to get there with fresh enough legs based on what we're seeing here. I'm going Team Chloe Hosking if this continues. Mitchelton Scott, they do have a lot of options, as do the Cordomantha Real Estate National Team. Speaking of that team, I've hardly spotted Katrin Garfield. Well, that's a no. good thing. She is there, the, and the team, the Cordomantha Australian National Team, are on the left of the, and the right of the road. So they've got the whole field cornered here. Um, we won't get any indication until we get to the, the big climb towards the end of Shalambra. That is, who survives that will decide the race. I'm not sure whether Chloe Hoskins can survive that climb. It's kind of six to one, half dozen to the other at yeah, the moment, Phil. Yeah, We're just waiting yeah. to see uh, what happens and who takes responsibility. What I can quite confidently say is the RLA Cipollini won't be forcing any breaks. I think that they will be vigorously chasing any to try and keep it Grupo Compado, but I don't think that they'll be forcing the break. Protecting their sprinter requires quite different tactics uh, yeah. than trying to win in a breakaway. Georgia Whitehouse and Lisa Morzenti are certainly still giving it their best. The break hasn't really come back at all since that minute and a half mark. The no. Fluoro helmets at the front of the Tibco team, the teammates of Shannon Molsey. She's the current Australian road champion. In the uh, race, as we get a chance to pan back and take a look at the gap between our two leaders, Whitehouse from the Sydney Uni Staminate team, who's joined forces a long time ago now with Morzenti from B Pink. Minute and 30 seconds, the peloton can see it. Multiple Australian champions or former Australian champions in the peloton. One of them who we haven't really spoken about so far today is Gracie Elvin. She's been the dual Australian champion, second the Tour of Flanders last year, and she doesn't necessarily have a major protected status on this team this year because she's got the defending champion, Van Vluten, the previous winner, Amanda Spratt. But Gracie Elvin is another rider everybody else has to watch. Absolutely right. I was actually with her yesterday, and she, she had a place to play, but uh, they made a bit of a mess of the finish in... Uh, in Albert Park, uh, she led out the rider, but the rider wasn't on her wheel. However, today is could be for her. She's very confident. Here's Amanda Spratt back to the team car. A uh, stocking full of ice, perhaps, by the looks of it, to stick that down the back of the jersey to try and stay cool. Amanda's got a little bandage on her elbow there. I don't know if she came down earlier. We never saw it, did we? That was from the final stage of the Santos Tour down okay. under. Cool. Oh, yes, of course, in the run-up to the finishing line there in the middle of the race. She was very lucky. She won the race nonetheless. Well, the riders do have race radio, but nothing quite beats face-to-face -face communication. She's getting a musette full of bottle and food there to take up to her teammates. Interesting that one of the more protected riders uh, would actually be doing that, but she does 
head out on course as captain on the road of the team, having a chat to Jean Bates in the car about tactics. I suggest she will head up and one by one dot through the field, pick up her riders and say, let's go. They're only about 10 kilometres, perhaps less, from going through Moriac and the official feed zone. If you can take advantage of the calmness in the peloton at this point and not have to worry about the stress of the feed zone, that puts you in a better chance to be able to attack pretty quickly once they get out the other side of that feed. Well, feed zones can be quite a messy uh, thing, but it looks like she might ice. actually have a pack of ice there. Um, she's po popping a big uh, thing. What they actually do, they feel the ends of stockings, they cut the legs off stockings and uh, fill them with ice and put them down the back of their jersey to cool themselves down. We're looking at the temperature gauge in here. It's not that hot out on course for what we think, uh, but the fact that the riders are cooling down, it's the second rider we've seen now with ice down their jersey, it does mm. indicate that the course, are, the conditions out on course are possibly a bit more challenging than, than what we can appreciate looking at these pictures and the temperature gauge. I think it's extremely humid. This reminds me of Malaysia and the races we do there in the month of February. Very humid indeed today. Perhaps more pleasant for the cyclists and the spectators in many ways because they do have a little cooling breeze which they create themselves. 44 kilometres, approximately one hour of racing left for these women. Might get sold a little bit with the climb, nine kilometres out from the finish. And they are just doing what they have to do. They're uh, driving the queue and chatting away. Robbie is ready to go. Robbie, it's down to you. Well, guys, I can confirm that it has got hotter now. We've moved away from the ocean. That uh, pleasant 25 degrees through Torquay and Bells Beach has now turned to a rather steamy and uncomfortable 32 degrees along Forest Road here. And there's just no breeze getting in here because in that forest, it's like riding through a tunnel. Uh, there have been a couple of skirmishes, as you've seen, but no really concerted efforts to bring this break back. They're pretty comfortable where they are. What I'm seeing is teams starting to look a little more organised, a little more interested in starting to place themselves at the front, get some chasing done. I'm seeing Kendall Ryan from the Tibco team rode so well in the race towards zero a couple of days ago. But I think Tibco, they may be inspired by the attack that was made earlier by Alice Cobb, the young Brit over the QOM. She was really impressive up that steeper section. She's so slightly built, very, very small and a pure climber. So they may be starting to think she has a good chance once they get to the circuits. Also now making an appearance to the front on the left is Katrin Garfoot, probably the big race favourite and not in one of the big race teams. But we all know how good she is and she's been a world medalist over the last couple of years, road race and time trial, and a lot of eyes are fixed on her because the big word on the street is she will attack on Chalambra and try and go solo. So that's what a lot of riders are concentrating on. But at the moment, it's again the calm before the storm. Even the Mitchelton riders at the moment handing drinks and food around, having a chat, a smile. They're pretty relaxed. Amanda Spratt on the right, Gracie Elvin just there as well. Sarah Roy just behind them. So still relaxed in the peloton, but I can feel the tension starting to build. Uh, Robbie, with that comment in mind about Katrin Garfoot and wanting to attack on Chalamba Crescent, do you feel the need for the court of the real estate team to heat the action up before they get there? I think it will be in Katrin's interest to have the race as hard as possible <laughs> before they get there but uh, not split to pieces, so not jumping down the road and trying to form breakaways, but just making it hard at every opportunity. But, uh, you know, they will need to cover a lot because there are teams like Mitchell and Scott who have the power in numbers. Where we talk about Katrin Garfoot being so good, I'm not sure they can match it as a team overall Excellent. against the might of Mitchell and Scott. And I'm sure Annemiek van Vluten is also watching Garfoot very closely and uh, well, could well be planning a move of her own because she doesn't have to sit and wait for anyone else. After all, she's on a big fun Vluten. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. As we look down to the Wiggle High Five team, this is Barbieri, the Italian on that squad, and Phil, she's loading up with the biddens. She's got the team domestic duties. And now the problem of getting it all back to the other women on the team because uh, those biddens are heavy, and she probably has got five at least in her pockets now to deliver. And we've got similar going on here. This is Molly Weaver, the British rider on Trek. I mean, a chat, she hangs on to that calm much longer. They will penalise her for that. 
And, Kate, we're seeing a lot of teams at this point, only a matter of kilometres away from the official feed zone, sending riders back to the team cars, making the most of this, as Robbie called it, the calm before the storm. It can be dangerous through the feed zone. It can be dangerous through the feed zone, but what we're also seeing is this collection of ice. And that's something that they can't really pick up at the feed zone because for the most part, they will just simply be grabbing water bottles. And so they are getting a lot of this ice to cool down. This is interesting. She really is hanging on the I'll car. I'll tell you, if, I, if the commissaire saw that, he would probably disqualify. Did you just hear race radio? Race Radio just said, Trek drops, it's imperative that the rider pedals the bicycle. Yep, absolutely that right. That is an official, unofficial warning. Well, if she's holding onto a water bottle, we'd call it a sticky bidden. But she wasn't, she was just hanging onto the car. So a sticky bidden of sorts, perhaps. Sue Blayton. Yeah. Specialised women's racing team starting to line up at the front there. They've got some great climbers in that team. Kate McElroy, she's been world mountain running champion. She's been to the Olympics for the triathlon uh, for New Zealand. She's a great climber. She'll be looking up Shalambra. Oh, it's good. This is our breakaway and our chasing peloton right here. A bit of wildlife. And the two up front are on a different team to the peloton, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> As we pan back down towards the peloton and the convoy of cars, plenty of riders in that convoy of cars collecting water bottles, taking the ice on as well. They've been racing now for a little bit over two hours in the fourth edition of the Deakin University Cadell Evans Great Ocean Road Race. We have two riders off the front, Lisa Morzenti, number 75, along with number 125, Georgia Whitehouse from the Sydney Uni Staminate team. I'll tell you what, Matt, this race is going to be incredible on that climb because there's so many believe now that they can win this race because they're still in the pack. The pressure has not been applied all day long. We're talking now hot temperatures now, 32 degrees, high humidity, and uh, until they get to the climb, we won't know who is going for it. Here's one of the contenders, the Australian national champion. Left-hand side of the screen, the yellow across the shoulders, the green and gray green and gold bands around the chest as well. Shannon Molseed, yep. she's really stepped up in the past 12 months and she's a genuine threat to win today. Well, until now, it, in pieces, it's looked like the peloton hasn't been going all that fast. From the average speed, we can see they're ticking along. Shannon Molseed there in the Tibco colours, the national champion stripe, number 51. So, so resplendent in the champion colours, but they're actually not working too hard now. Molseed isn't even pedaling at the moment. And Phil, superstition among cyclists. We've seen Fabian Cancellara so often put number 13 upside down. How would Shannon Molseed feel about number 51 if she knows the history of that number? Well, she should feel very proud because you don't choose a number before you ride a bike race. And yet 51 has won the Tour de France more times than any other number, except number one, of course, uh, for the defending champion. And with Lance Armstrong losing his seven titles, that meant six times he rode with number one on, the odds may have come down somewhat. Speaking of number one, here is the world's number one cyclist. This is Annemiek van Vluten. She's the second oldest in the race, and she's a rider with plenty of experience, but she's still right in the sweet spot of her career. World champion in the time trial last year. She was also part of that strong Dutch team that delivered the rainbow jersey to the Netherlands as well. Won this race, the Giro Rosa, the Le Course by the Tour de France. What a season it was. And she's hard to go past as a winner of today's race. I quite agree. I think uh, her catching Garfoot, I think it'll be a bit too hard for Shannon Malseed. All the answers will come nine kilometres out from the finish for the first selection. And then we'll see how they go down to the line what is a beautiful day on the Esplanade because that's where we're commentating from in the city of Geelong. And continuing still along Forest Road, here are our two leaders at the front. This is White House. In second position is Morzenti. White House, she's picked up the points in Torquay for the Mapai Sprint Prize. She also picked them up in Bells Beach for the Subaru Queen of the Mountains. And Morzenti, her birthday just a few days ago, she's in much better form than what she showed at the Tour Down Under. And Kate, all of a sudden, her advantage, just inside 40 kilometres to go, is back out over three minutes. Well, their pace has just continued to uh, grow and to be steady. We thought that over the QOM, they'd lose a bit of time. They did. We didn't expect it to go back out. We thought the peloton would be a little bit more diligent uh, in chasing it back and bringing it back. 
A lot of waiting and looking and watching going on from the peloton, heading toward uh, the back end of the race. Number 131 for the Cordamenta real estate team. This is Katrin Garfoot. And there has not been a single rider that I've asked in the past 48 hours as to who the favourites are that has not mentioned Katrin Garfoot. She's cool as a cucumber, just sitting in the middle, protecting herself and not working too hard. Certainly if it comes down uh, to a bunch of whatever size going up to that Chalambra Crescent climb, it's hard to go past Katrin Garfoot. She's got a lot on the line this year, and it's for her, she's achieved some tremendous things in the sport. But to be able to stand atop the podium um, at a Commonwealth Games, a home Commonwealth Games for her, since she's Australian from the Gold Coast, I think that's very important to her. She's certainly laying down the pavement for the success of that. Last year, Katrin Garfoot at the World Championships, she collected the bronze medal in the individual time trial. I think it was 18 seconds behind Annemiek van Vluten. And then in the sprint for second place of the World Championships, she brought home the silver medal. What a performance. Yeah, she's an amazing rider. She's achieved an awful lot. She came into the sport quite late as well. And uh, now she's concentrating here in Australia, 36 years of age. So she's reaching the end of her career. She'd love to go out on a high note in April in Brisbane. But right now, we will see her attack. There's no question. It's a, only a question of when and where. We can see Team Virtue Cycling grouping at the front there. We've expected them to be a bit more antagonistic in the race today than we've seen so far. But it is an indicator with four of the riders up the front there, headed by Linda Willemsen, the former world time trial champion, that they perhaps have something on their mind to start making a move or, Phil, they're aware that the other teams may be making a move to pretty soon and they want to be a part of that. This breakaway is still riding a steady pace up the front. They have opened that gap back out toward the three-minute mark. I'm not sure either of those riders would have expected it to go back out to there, but you've got to make the most of it. Um, they're riding comfortably. They do look more comfortable than they did 20, 30-odd kilometres ago. And they might be holding out hope that they can survive to series, which is at 15.6 kilometres to go. Winner takes all. And the next of the intermediate sprints. Yeah. Absolutely right. And if this woman, Whitehouse, can collect the three points there, as she did in Torquay, she has an unassailable lead. She believes she can now, but uh, it's still a tough call. That's a 15 kilometres from the finish, so still a long way to go there. She's been in the lead now for over 55 kilometres, and then she was joined a few K into the attack by Lisa Mazenti. We can see the Mitchelton Scott riders are starting to group the uh, bright yellow shoulders on the black jerseys and the yellow helmets. They're starting to group and move further toward the front. Race, not... Race Radio giving an update on the time gap. One minute and 49 seconds, they're saying now. So that's a dramatic drop from the three-minute time check that we saw just a few moments ago. Mm, something not quite right there, I think, Matt. But uh, these women haven't tried to bring them back. They're still controlling their own race here waiting for the terrain change of direction perhaps or indeed the, the climb of a shalabra we haven't seen a sprinter win on this course yet rachel nayland amanda spratt and anamik van vloten have all won uh, in tremendous style but not in a bunch sprint chloe hosking is of course looking to change that if Katrin Garfoot can't in fact get a break over shalamba crescent then loretta hansen's an excellent sprint opportunity for them she's an up-and-comer she's just been getting better every year faster Garfoot's not slow Garfoot is not slow no but if we're talking about a bunch sprint uh, you know then the rider like Loretta Hansen would possibly be a better bet um, up against Chloe but you, you're correct Garfoot certainly isn't slow. And then in terms of the final kilometres, we take a look at the race profile and you go towards the back end of the latter part of the 113.4 k's. This year, the sprint finish has been moved a little bit further along the foreshore to Steam Packet Gardens. So it's more downhill onto the finish line. It's going to be a higher speed sprint finish. Well, the profile makes it almost look as though they come in on a descent. And it's not quite like that. It's a little bit uh, deceptive on the profile there but it is definitely uh, there's no uphill lumps it's a downhill uh, to flat run and we do expect it to be quite fast coming in which suits the sprinters if they can get over the top of that climb still in contact they don't need to be at the front of the bunch they just need a solid wheel in front of them 
which they can then move up from. And Phil, history tells us the longer the peloton meander along at this sort of pace, the more explosive it will be once the action really does start. Then we'll find out the strength of the day for sure and how many of the women are surviving here uh, but are not really in the race. And it'll only come, I think, on the climb, nine kilometres out from the finish. There's got to be a series of attacks by those with ambition. So I think Garfoot will be the one to start it all off. I feel sure about that. And Amanda Spatz got great form. Rachel Nail and always sharp and very good tactician. And, of course, Van Vluten. Well, I think she's still my favourite. Morzenti, Whitehouse. 20 kilometres to series and the second of the intermediate sprints. A minute and 39 seconds with the peloton yet to really hit the pedals in any sort of anger. If they light it up, it'll only take them a matter of about five kilometres to reel in that 139. Unfortunately for the two leaders, I've been pessimistic since the start about their chances of surviving to the finish, and I'm equally as pessimistic about their chances of making it to series for the sprint. Well, they've done a pretty good job um, of holding the field off. They've certainly stayed out longer than we anticipated. In the last shots we saw of White House, she was stretching, she was banging her legs. She's starting to look quite fatigued. I'm not sure she expected to still be out there at this point. She's had an up and down day uh, with some misadventure with the flat tyre and uh, not the most efficient wheel change. Uh, could we say, which not only affects her physically, but also emotionally. I have to say I'm very, very impressed at how she rallied after that. Uh, it would be easy for that to really affect an athlete, but she's done a pretty good job. Ale Cipollini starting to really bunch toward the front again. We can see Chloe Hosking just on the bottom left-hand side of the screen, just behind, tucked in behind Garfoot and Cromwell, who are now having a bit of a chat. They're the two riders at the front. It is... Cromwell with the dark coloured helmet on, the yellow helmet with Katrin Garfoot. They've made the right hand turn off Forest Road. Shortly they'll make a left hand turn onto Hendy Main Road. And the wind is very subtle today, if at all, but Hendy Road is a lot more exposed than what Forest Road was. So they're just paying very close attention to the fronts. And it's as if Shannon Molsey, the Australian national champion, was trying to eavesdrop on the conversation in front of her. Well, you may notice that Katrin Garfoot is wearing the same helmet and riding the same bike as the Mitchelton Scott team. That's because last year she was a member of that team. This year she's not, but she's kept that gear as uh, one of the most important riders in our national team. They're just having a chat. They both look fairly relaxed. Tiffany Cromwell, leader on the road. She's one of the more experienced uh, Australian riders in this international field. And they'll just be discussing tactics and what to do, how long to wait perhaps. Last year, Annemiek van Vloten did not go into the race as a protected rider for the Mitchelton Scott team. But Amanda Spratt, partway through the race, okay. told uh, van Vloten that her legs weren't great and they slightly had to change tactics and the way it played out. So while they may go into the race uh, with a firm tactic and a rider to protect, it doesn't always work out like that. So I suggest Tiffany Cromwell's probably also saying to Kat, how are you feeling? Are your legs still good? Are we still on? for the anticipated plan. That ongoing communication. Here's another one of their teammates coming forward in the white colours on the left-hand side of the screen. That's Lauren Kitchen riding for the Cordamantha Real Estate team today, the Australian national team. Throughout season 2018, Kitchen, new team for her. She's riding with the French squad, FDJ. And she'll be joining the other Australian, Shara Gillow, who's been on that team for the last two years. Unfortunately, Shara Gillow is not in the race today, but she's had a great couple of seasons with that French outfit. Here are the two leaders once again. I don't believe that they'll survive for too much longer. Robbie McEwen is down in amongst the race. And Robbie, we're 34.2 kilometres to go. But we're going to make the call early. Who do you think is going to win? Coming up. I'm picking Katrin Garfoot. I've said she's, of course, one of the favourites, but she is my number one pick. And why? Well, I think for one thing, she's in fantastic form. We saw that at the National Championships where she was caught heartbreakingly in the last 50 metres. But for mine, she was the best rider in the race, even though she didn't win the race. But what sets her apart is I think she has that 
cool, calm, collected manner about her in the race. She's very confident with how she's going. And she's got a really good mix of explosiveness, but that time trial ability as well. So I think she can be the one to really go on the climb and gap everybody. And once she does, she's got the, the power, she's got the engine to keep that going. If anyone can go with her, I think it's possibly Annemiek van Vluten but Katrin Garfoot is not slow in a sprint. And I can tell you, there's a lot of A and B grade club riders on the Gold Coast who she races against when she's home that can testify to the fact that she's pretty fast at the finish because she's cleaned up a lot of those blokes in the club races. So she gets a lot of training for a, a sprint finish as well. So uh, she's my pick all round. She's also got a point to prove. She's no longer with Mitchelton Scott because she wanted to stay at home in Australia, not travel anymore, not be away overseas, and at least see her husband a little bit. She's been away on the road for the last couple of years. But she's got a point to prove her. I can do it this way, riding in the national team, staying at home, and there's a big preparation towards Commonwealth Games, and she'd love to get the first big win of the season in the one-day races. There you heard it from Robbie McEwen, triple winner of the green jersey at the Tour de France. He's on board. Katrin Garfoot, who's from the Gold Coast, just like Robbie. And Katrin Garfoot, she has had a really good start to the season. She won the individual time trial title for the third year running at the National Championships. And it was a victory of more than two and a half minutes on her nearest rival, Lucy Kennedy, with Shara Gillow in third position. Garfoot will be heavily marked. We're waiting to see a bit of action from her quarterman, the real estate team, to make the race a little bit tougher. Yeah. Here are our two leaders once again. Whitehead out in front for Sydney Uni Staminade, and it's Morzenti, number 75, the Italian from the B Pink team. Well, they've continued to keep the pressure on. They've got on with their job. They've not worried what the Peloton are doing at the moment. Peloton quite clearly is wait and see. That's been their attitude for a long while now. Some 60 kilometres ahead now uh, for White House, and she was joined by Morzenti and 32 kilometers goes 20 miles still left to race uh, but it's the hardest part of the course ahead and uh, the peloton knows that and that's why they're waiting they're in fighting they really don't include these two in the competition as far as they are concerned 134 will never survive the day well they've got 17 kilometers till the next intermediate sprint i think one one step at a time if they can survive till there then georgia whitehouse could potentially get a very big re reward or more zenty uh, whoever takes that sprint out could get the map eye sprint jersey for the day for their efforts you kind of hope that they survive even by a few seconds uh, for that to be rewarded for this quite epic effort they deserve to survive as they make their way past the Ega panthers and into moriac for the feed zone these two won't really need to take advantage of the feed zone. As being in the breakaway, they've had the chance to regularly go back to their team car, pick up water bottles, pick up any food that required. And finally, Whitehouse, she's had the last tube that was on the top tube. <laughs> well, she can pick a few more up in the feed zone if she needs some more of those. It is important, of course, to hydrate and to eat while you're out on course. You can get a very terrible uh, negative energy effect at the back end of the race if you don't take care of that. The peloton does look like they're stretching out a bit heading into the feed zone simply in order to be able to grab their bottles if they're all uh, grouped together it's very difficult uh, to be able to get that but honestly they just look quite disinterested in racing it's within you know 32 kilometers to go at what point uh, they need to really turn the screws and get into it because of the hard nature of that final 10 kilometers they really can leave it quite late what do you think after the feed zone? Do we see some action once they get out the other side of Moria? Oh, to be honest, I think I think they'll leave it almost to the last minute. We might see a few um, few mild attacks, but they have not indicated um, at any at any point yet, Matt, that they're interested in animating it early and forcing the pace. We've seen the, the teams start to group toward the front which is an indicator, but we can see they're in the middle of the peloton. Uh, four of the Mitchelton Scott riders, that's Amanda Spratt, number two just at the back there, and uh, number three, Janelle Crooks, at the front. Annemiek van Vloten is the sole Mitchelton rider heading up toward the front, but there's certainly no concerted team effort uh, to lift the pace at all. No, but it may be significant that uh, van Vloten has come right up to the front there and taken the inside. 
and she's in a position now to do something about it. Now, that will not have gone unnoticed because they're running out of time, let's face it, 31 kilometres out, and it's still uh, 15 kilometres before the second sprint, so they're not sure they're going to stay away, those two women up front. If they did, well, obviously, they've taken most of the points, and the finish would not make any difference to the final standings, but we'll see. What I can't understand is why so many riders are lying off the back wheels of each other here unless they've been back to the cars because there's been no pressure to cause this situation. The only thing I can think, Phil, is that heading into the feed zone, uh, the teams will want to separate themselves from each other in order to get water bottles. Each team will have one or two soigneurs standing on the side of the road with a water bottle and if each rider is stacked one behind the other, it's very difficult for all uh, four, six riders to, in fact, uh, get the bottles. So what we see on the left, the WOW deals um, have three or four riders in a row. They kind of need to mix that up and break that up a bit if they want access uh, to the food and water that the Soigniers uh, will have ready for them. But certainly playing out in an interesting way. The whole team is together there, in fact, the WOW deals cycling team. Uh, down the left-hand side, you can see the Aqua uh, the green aqua jerseys, Mitchelton Scott on the right, uh, relatively together as well. Some specialised women's racing taking the advantage of the slowing pace to move out and improve their position. 126 uh, hovered, they've got them absolutely pegged, front and back doing the same speed here, 30.6 kilometres to go. They've got through the undulations. We're getting onto slightly more, less hostile roads for a little while. The wind itself is non-existent, unheard of in this part of the world. It is an idyllic day in Geelong. Absolutely beautiful, just very, very pleasant conditions, and a lovely crowd waiting to bring these riders back home. But when you say hostile, it makes it sound like a war zone. <laughs> the riders certainly have had a reasonably pleasant day. Uh, out on course, save for those two breakaway riders who have been slugging it out for quite a while now. They went on a reasonably early breakaway. We didn't think they'd survive this long. Against the odds, I think we could say. Uh, they've maintained over that minute. They didn't know it. They didn't know each other this morning. They know each other now. And they shan't forget each other after a day uh, together like this. The New Zealand national team, they're a young team, all under 23 riders. Interestingly, they're the ones uh, forcing a little bit of pace here, not in, not in an attacking style, just lifting uh, the pace of the peloton and taking some responsibility for that. They've got some great, talented young riders. Grace Anderson uh, was in exceptional form in Adelaide at the Tour Down Under. We haven't seen much of her today. She's back in the peloton. The Shalambra Crescent climb will suit her to a T. That's why you haven't seen much of her. She's waiting. And the New Zealand team here getting big experience because they don't get the chance to race against uh, the top women of the world in this part of the world. So big experience for the youngsters there from New Zealand. And uh, now you can see the gap. A minute and eight seconds now. They know exactly what they're doing in the peloton inside 30 kilometers. They've got this race totally under control. Is Robbie McEwen, he's just bridged across to the breakaway the easy way on the back of the motorbike. He's having the easiest day of anybody out there, uh, jetting between the breakaway and the main peloton. The pace has increased. The New Zealand team taking a bit of responsibility and forcing uh, the other riders. You can start to see that they're working a little bit harder. It's going slightly uphill here. We can see the shoulders bopping a little bit about. That's a good indicator of effort uh, going on there. Kate, we've heard from Robbie McEwen. He's declared his hand. He's tipped number 131. Katrin Garfoot as the winner today. Who are you on? Well, I'm going to go with a similar number theme, and I'm going to go for number 31, Chloe Hosking. There she is. She's just sitting pretty kind of cool as a cucumber in the middle of the pack there, not working too hard, very protected. Uh, for a sprinter as herself, she won the final stage of the Santos Tour Down Under, and after a fall, um, as well in the middle of that race. 
She's just sitting there looking after herself, fresh legs, fresh mind. Do you think the calmness of the race is to her advantage or disadvantage because this calmness will make it more explosive on the climb? Well, I think it, it works to her advantage because she is actually quite a handy climber in a one-off uh, scenario. What gets Chloe is the cumulative effect of some long climbs. So I think it plays into her hand. She's also really feisty. So every minute that they just tick over like this, she's kind of rubbing her hands together and thinking, oh, thank you, ladies, playing right into my hands. The oh. great thing about Chloe Hosking is you're never in any doubt where you stand. <laughs> no, you're right about that. She's got that real sprinter mentality. She's kind of like Robbie McEwen. You know, of the women's peloton, you just always know that she will fight to the absolute death. If she can sniff it, yes. she can definitely get over climbs that if she didn't imagine the finish was there, that she wouldn't be able to. The breakaway, they're almost back. They're within 25 seconds now, but more importantly, the peloton's just there. They're, they're right behind. I they're think, about yeah, to be caught. 25 metres is probably better right now. Yeah, they're coming back in now. It's all over. 29 kilometres out, and they started this move 91 kilometres out. So it's time for the handshake. And they didn't quite get out to decide the sprint competition, so that could still come from the main field. That's great sportsmanship, seeing the uh, the hands being shaken there. They've done a great effort today. We uh, saw through the intermediate sprint a few strange games going on, but they regrouped and they started working exceptionally well together. They've had a great run out. I love seeing the good sportsmanship. Even though they're not teammates, they've certainly ridden like teammates for the day, but they'll be absorbed back into the peloton now. And for all the talk about the peloton not really having to chase too hard, the self-selective nature of this course has brought them back in. So Grupo Compato all back together. Within the last 30 kilometres of the race, they've got an intermediate sprint to go, they've got a QOM to go. It's certainly certainly a lot left to challenge the riders specialized women's racing team taking responsibility for the pace now and now the two riders from the breakaway morzenti and whitehouse they're trying to up their own tempo to <laughs> stay in the front end of the peloton and not get swamped and spat out the back door well it won't be too long before they'll be comfortably into the pack let's hope that they can actually hold on to the pack once they start the pressure on the climb they've had a great day out they've led for 65 kilometers today well deserved of the handshake and, and rather sad they never made that last sprint which is not very far ahead 28 kilometers ago they're 13 kilometers short of that sprint which would have decided the sprint competition and the jerry ryan trophy well i was always of the view that they weren't going to make it to the finish and it was unlikely that they were going to make it to that next intermediate sprint and unfortunately that proved to be the case but they've, they've actually proved us wrong in getting this far uh, so full kudos to them yep. and as we say once again the bunch is looking very relaxed wow deals are taking responsibility for the pace now they've got three riders on the front specialized women's racing have a few riders and trek drops are also represented who we can't see is Mitchelton Scott or Cordamenta National Team. This is Rihanna Marcus at the front for the Wild Deals team in the green colours. And the Dutch come into the front as soon as they're away from the protection of the trees. The roads get exposed and the wind specialists, they just pop up. There she is, Anna McVan Vluten, last year's winner. Sitting behind her is Gracie Elvin, a dual Australian champion. Phil, we've heard from both Robbie McEwen and Kate Bates as to who they think will win. Who are you on? Number one, and there she is right there, riding in front of her teammate there, Gracie Elvin, who will be looking, if she can, to lead her out for the line, if she needs a lead out. I think, I think uh, she's in with a chance. She won this race back in 2016, uh, but so much has happened in her life since then, apart from that dreadful crash in the Olympic Games in 2016. Last year was one of those years. She'll be looking to repeat, placed in all the major classics. She's won five stages, for example, of the Women's Tour of Italy. Uh, this is a course that suits her. She's confident. She loves Australia. And above all, she rides for the top Australian team. And I've seen uh, Jerry Ryan and Val Ryan, the owners of that team, waiting at the finishing line. You don't need a bigger magnet than that. And uh, Annemiek, Annemiek would love to win today. She'll be a tough one to beat, that's for sure.
very exciting for the sport in Australia to have such a stacked field of international riders, to have the world uh, number one in Van Vloten down here and in form. It's just tremendous and great for the Australian domestic riders uh, to get the chance to race against them and for the Europeans to tweak their form before the spring classics. There's the recently crowned New Zealand national champion, number five, Georgie Williams, who's in brilliant form, but I'm not sure she's going to get too many chances today. Being a teammate of both Annemiek van Vluten, who Phil has spoken about in glowing terms, and Amanda Spratt, who has also won this race in the past. It's a matter of position now and holding your own before you get to the climb. You've all declared your favourite. I'm going to go with a dark horse. Number 102, Grace Brown. Oh. Many of the internationals, they won't be aware of Grace Brown. She's won some races on the domestic circuit last year. She comes into the season with some really good form. And she's the kind of rider that could cause the big upset. And this may well be today the turning point of Grace Brown's career. One of Australia's best ever road cyclists, Anna Wilson. Grace Brown reminds me of Anna Wilson. She's very strong in the time trial. She's exceptionally talented That's in the road rap. race. It is a big rap. But the speed at which she's, let's say, accelerated into form and through the ranks is just phenomenal. She's got a really great attitude. And she's been really well mentored and looked after by the Holden team. They have a lot of very glowing words to say about her too. And let's say her results speak for herself. Matilda Reynolds going a little bit cross-country there, taking it in her own hands. Important to get up to the front. Shows the increase of the tension in the peloton. The pace hasn't increased, but there is that tension to be at the front. And Katrin Garfoot from the Cordamenta real estate team, she was right at the front. Exactly. I, I thought I was seeing things for a moment. One of the race favourites riding right on the front to be closing. She's 1-3-1. One, one. And that's a message going out to everyone now. They're controlling this race till it's all out on the climb. And Anna uh, Van Vluten, <laughs> Annemiek Van Vluten, has chosen to take her back wheel as well, number one. But did you see who was tucked in just behind that? Number 31, Chloe uh, Hosking. Look at that. We've, <laughs> we've got a couple of them lined up there. She's tucked herself right in amongst that Mitchelton Scott team. Very good tactic. She just needs to hold on and hold their wheels over that climb. And if she just follows uh, their favourites, Van Vloten and Spratt, that's very beneficial for her. Number four, just trying to get a bite to eat. That's Gracie Alvin. And she's part of the group that has formed the Cycling Alliance. This is an initiative in women's cycling to try and get better conditions for the women, including a minimum salary, and also working with media outlets to try and get more exposure to raise the profile of women's cycling. Gracie Alvin, dual Australian road champion, second in the Tour of Flanders last year, a big part of the Cycling Alliance, which you can follow on all the various social media elements by just searching the Cycling Alliance. And Gracie's come from a mountain bike uh, background, not too similar to Cadell Evans. And she spent the summer dinking around uh, across the country. She's from Canberra on her mountain bike. Uh, getting form, a little bit of a different way to spend the off-season. But certainly for Gracie, it helps her keep her head screwed on. It keeps her relaxed and not a lot of pressure. Keeps her fresh. Number 51, down to the left, Shannon Molsey, Australian national champion. She's looking very composed. The team's got confidence in her, which is important. Linda Villamson from Team Virtue Cycling. She's Never got, write her off. She's no. She's got great credentials. You certainly don't want to let her go uh, on her own. She hasn't attacked yet normally, um, regardless of anything. When the speed drops, Linda isn't afraid uh, to give it a bit of stick and, and dig her heels in and have a go. So I'd suggest oh. she's also waiting for the back end. Just of the looking race. at 132, just coming to camera here, uh, Kate. That's Rachel Nayland taking to the cross country bit, and she's okay, but. We've never talked her in any year as a possible winner of this race. She won the first one, then she finished third, then she finished second. She's always finished in the top three of this race. The challenge for Rachel Nayland today is the fact that she's got the big pre-race favourite on her team, Katrin Garfoot, and a secondary favourite as well with Lauren Kitchen. She's also spoken about the fact that she's targeting some races later in the season and she's been in the gym, doing a lot of work in the gym and she's found it a little difficult with the soreness in the legs from the gym work and translating that to the bike and her form's not quite in her mind where she thinks it needs to be at this point. Number 125, White House yeah. at the back with teammates wrapping their arms around her. Likewise, number 75, Morzenti. The two women yeah, were in the breakaway all day long. Done a great ride. 
the names that we'll talk about, I hope, for the rest of the season. Now we've seen him in action here. These long straight roads are very depressing if you're in the lead, but there's nobody in the lead now. And take a look at the sharp end of the peloton. The ones who feel they have a chance are now in the front 25 riders of the race. Here comes a right-hand turn. Although it's not windy, it is a lot more exposed again at this point. And you can feel the tempo is starting to increase. This is Janelle Crooks, who is now at the front. And just behind her is Rihanna Marcus from the Well Deals team. And there's a little bit of movement. It is the Holden Gusto team trying to slip off the front. Mateo. Nice move. Matilda Reynolds has put in a lot of effort for the Holden team, Gusto. She's a very aggressive rider and she's instigated uh, this move. She's not getting a lot of help. The two riders uh, following her from Team 2020 and Tibco, they're happy to just sit there and let Matilda do the work. But Mitchelton Scott are getting organised. On the left, that's Amanda Spratt. On the front, Sarah Roy. Oh, no, following that's, uh... just behind Van Vloten coming through. There must be some crosswinds. The way they are riding like this indicates to me that there's some serious crosswinds going on. And this is Gracie Alvin now coming through to the front. Orders are out. This is the this is the move. 23k out. It's turned into a team time trial for Mitchelton Scott. What wind there is is slightly from the left shoulder. Sarah Roy now charging through, getting down towards the business end of the race, and it is really starting to heat up. Yeah, that change of direction, the wind has increased by about five kilometres an hour as we come away from the coast, and that has been noticed. Now, there's a, you see the split at the back now, the weaker riders unhitching a little bit. Court well, wasn't expecting that, that's a bad move. Annemiek van Vluten, the number one. Most pre-race interviews with her go something along the lines of, we want to make it hard at the start, we'll attack in the middle and go full gas at the finish. This is Amanda Spratt. Next is Sarah Roy coming through. The white colours with the Kiwi national champion. We can see the damage at the back of the peloton. Yeah, our two breakaway heroes will be looking to survive the pressure just now. That 23 kilometres out from the finishing line. Take a look over the shoulder of the peloton. It's catching a few women out now. Chloe Hosking just tucked into the Mitchelton train. They're looking after herself. You need to stay out of the wind and fairly protected. She's a very smart rider. This is a very savvy move. This gives me confidence in my pick, I've got to say, to see her riding in such a protective way. She's not relying on her teammates. She knows they're there if she needs them, but she's really taking it into her own hands. Shannon Molseed, the national champion, sitting tightly just in next to her. When you see the might of the Mitchelton Scott team go to the front, you'd be a bit of a fool to ignore it. Pleased to see the pre-race favourites are paying attention at this point because this is a really decisive time in the race. 22 kilometres left to go. Not a flat section, really. Talk about the strength in numbers of the team with Mitchelton Scott. Chloe Hosking, virtually on her own at the front for the LA Cipollini team. If there's anybody in this race that can get the job done without teammates, it is Chloe Hosking. But having said that, the fluoro colours of LA Cipollini, a few of them have arrived because they know they've got a contender. Chloe is in the mix. It gives you a lot of confidence to know that you have your team there, but also know how to look after yourself and protect yourself just in case they don't turn up at the right moment. When she won the stage last week in Adelaide, the entire team fell off uh, with a couple of laps to go. And at the finish, Chloe was on her own in terms of a lead out. But what we saw when she crossed the lines with her arm in the air, was her teammates, 50, 60 back, also put their arms in the air. It was a very big team effort, and she's in very good hands. Just having them there is a big confidence booster. Matilda Reynolds again at the front of the bunch for the Holden team. And Virtue Cycling, that's Trina Smith. She's a very good track rider. I'm not sure she'll get over the Shalamba Crescent climb, but she's certainly, she's been European champion and certainly has a turn of speed. Here's the next move. It's the Trek Drops team which are attacking now as they're heading towards the outskirts of Geelong, the exposed roads. And Katrin Garfoot is the rider in the white colours from Cordamenta Real Estate who is doing the responding. Well, forget the legs for a moment here. If you're not paying attention, that's where the biggest damage fact, no, can wasn't. get done. It was Georgie Williams who's got the white colours on with the yellow helmet. The New Zealand national champion it was that closed it down. Yeah. Garfoot is just a few wheels further back, riding protected from the wind. Very smart. The teams that matter have come to the front, as they often do. 21k out, they're looking at the first sprint. Nobody's really interested in that sprint. It's more a stepping stone to the climb itself because the sprint is 15 kilometres out and we go over the top of the crescent at nine kilometres from the finish. And by then, I suspect our peloton will be half the size it is now. 
because they've told the helpers on the team, what we call the domestiques, to drive the pace, and it's had an effect. And every time an attempt to cause a split gets nullified, you just see heads on a swivel, looking around, waiting for the next move. Well, and if they're not careful, they look one way and the attack <laughs> goes the other way. What's really smart in this kind of scenario is to hug one side of the road and then attacks can only come from one side. If you're just sitting in the middle, you kind of open left and right. If they were mothers, they wouldn't have a problem because all mums have got eyes in the back <laughs> of their heads as well. Never miss a beat. At least my mum never did. Back of the peloton. Survival time for some. The young New Zealand national team at the back of the group. That was Grace Anderson, number 142. Rode brilliantly across in Adelaide, winning the best young rider classification in the Santos Tour Down Under. You can see a lot of movement in the peloton here. They are all together and bunched up, but there's a lot of side to side athletes choosing their position within the field, using it as a bit of recovery fill, but also maybe to get a cheeky uh, few moves up of position without having to spend too much energy. Well, Robbie McEwen is right in the thick of the action at the front of the peloton. Robbie, the race is really starting to change complexion. Well, Matt, yes, it is, because now we are hitting the hilly part of the circuit. Onto that first major climb that brings them back into Geelong. They just dive down that downhill at 80 kilometres an hour, and we're now getting an attack from Janelle Crooks. So Mitchell and Scott are starting to play their cards. We said they had strength in numbers, and they're using now as soon as the road goes up. Crooks straight out of the saddle, and she is riding as if she's in the last 300 metres of a stage. Being chased by one of the LA Cipollini riders, things really starting to string out at the front. But Crooks sits down, has a look, goes another gear. She's giving it everything she's got. And this is not with her own chances in mind. That's one thing for certain. They just want to make the race hard and use their numerical superiority. So she sits down, she's lifting herself out of the saddle again, always trying to re-accelerate. Looking down the line, I see Chloe Hosking still hanging tough in that first 10. Katrin Garfoot, she's down almost in a time trial position, staying out of the wind. So at the moment, Mitchell and Scott starting to stir things up and we've got another uphill coming in just a moment. But first, another fast dive down. It's going to be jostling for positions to try and make that attack because the longer climb is yet to come. Janelle Crooks, the sacrificial lamb. <laughs> I'm not sure that uh, that's the title she gets given in the race meeting, but that's certainly uh, what happens. A great attack from her, a great chase from Arle Cipollini from Soraya Paladin. Of course, we don't expect uh, Arle Cipollini to join any leaders in chase. What they're doing is protecting Chloe. We could see that Chloe Hosking was just a few wheels back looking after herself. What we can also see, the edge of the road, it's a little bit rough. They've got a ripple strip to contend with. The riders need to be really careful to choose their point in the road, save as much energy as they can. It was this point on the course a couple of years ago that Amanda Spratt really took an advantage and forced the pace. The peloton was reduced to 20 or 30 in those efforts. We're not quite down to that yet, but we can see that the peloton are starting to suffer. Some riders have fallen off the back. We can expect another attack. Mitchelton Scott are primed to do it, but everybody is on high alert. Still a large portion of the original peloton, 87 starters in contact. The next to move, and again, it is Janelle Crooks, so she really is the sacrificial lamb. Break the race up, Janelle, the youngest rider on the team, and she is doing some damage. This is to be expected, that they know they're the team to beat, they know everybody expects them to provide the race with its winner, and so they're waiting for their moves, but they're marking the moves at the moment. And there's a reaction coming again from the field, or is there? This is the Wiggle team, this is Barbieri that is marking the move. Another one of the young riders in the race. I have a feeling the whole of the uh, Mitchell and Scott team just blocked off the peloton, but it's clawing its way back anyway. Well, Janelle Crooks is starting to look a bit fatigued as the uh, sacrificial lamb, as you put it, Matt. She is just going to keep attacking until she can't attack anymore. Uh, but people are heightened to that. It was Lauren Kitchen from the Cordometha real estate team who bridged across there, bringing the field with them. Amanda Spratt, look, she's just sitting back. She's quite relaxed. And in fourth position, it's one of the riders from the Silence Pro Cycling team. That's the team of Georgia Bronzini, the world champion from Geelong in 2010.
We haven't mentioned her much recently. We haven't seen her either, mind you. But if she stays in there and hides and sneaks through and gets over the climbs, she's another really quick sprinter. Well, that's a mark of a very smart bike race from them that we have not mentioned them because we have not seen them. We <laughs> Next move is coming, and this time it is Amanda Spratt who goes. Now, this will be a real serious shape, and there's a quick reaction here. Not surprisingly, shut down immediately. And Garth Last year's is winner. Who does the She's job. the first one to do it as she jumps onto the back wheel of Spratt because Spratt is very much a marked woman. Sarah Top Roy, two finish. just a few wheels back, and she goes. Sarah Roy for Mitchelton Scott applies the pressure. Roy is going. Loretta Hansen is the one with the blue helmet who is trying to respond. Sarah Roy, more noted as a sprinter, but not the sort of rider you can give too much latitude to. I think we have a few sacrificial lambs in the Mitchelton. Uh, there's uh, no Scott doubt Cullors the whole today. team is racing for Van Vluten right now, and that's why they're throwing everybody else into these moves. And Anne Meek will be watching the move, and there's just one or two of the riders are back there. Just one kilometre until the sprint now, Phil. They won't be really looking too much to go for the sprint. Chloe Hosking in third wheel, taking care of herself, just making sure she's safe. The danger zone is when those attacks come back, and the next one is sure to go. Well, she better watch out because this is a move by Katrin Hammers of Germany here for Trek. And there's an attack by Spratt. Van Vluten, it is Sorry, Van Vluten, number yes. one, and the reaction coming from 1 3 1. The two pre race favourites, former teammates, Van Vluten. Then Garfoot, followed by Spratt and Chloe Hosking, four of the big favourites yeah, at the front. Not too sure why they did that. Because <laughs> uh, the attacks have been coming thick and fast, uh, but it's the three favourites, one, 131 and two, have gone out together with Hoskins on the back wheel of them. And the rider in the purplish colours from Trek Drops, that's Taylor Wiles. Spratt, is she going again? Yes, she is. Hosking is right on her hammer. Followed then by Shannon Molsey. Well, we're going to see a nice sprint for th one, two, and three in this. Three, two, one points in the map I sprint. I think they're ignoring the sprint and trying to win the bike race. Maybe, but don't forget, the winner of this sprint is going to score heavily at the finish. They could yes. do the double. Interesting tactics by Mitchelton Scott. They really are very clearly after the win here today. They're sending one rider after another. Janelle Crook, Sarah Roy. We've seen Amanda Spratt and Van Vloten. And that graphic tells the story, the amount of climbing that they've done in the last two kilometres. Well, they've got a bit of a descent coming up before they head up that nasty one into Shalambra Crescent. A breakaway well, of three is heading off the front. That's the first three for the sprint. And that's Georgia Williams, another Mitchelton Scott rider. Lauren Kitchen fast on her wheel and Alison Jackson from Team Tibco, Tibco Silicon Valley Bank. The three riders do look to have a small gap. We'll wait till we can pan back to the peloton to see how far they're gone. I'd be surprised if they're letting them get too far away, but Georgia Williams, we know she's on form. Lauren she's Kitchen. certainly forcing the pace. Here's the rider who sits in second position. Jackson at the rear of the group. Another rider coming across. This time it's from the Wiggle High Five team. And it's the French woman, Audrey Cordon. Don't write this lady off. She's a terrific bike rider. <laughs> Four in the lead now. Four teams represented. This Four strong teams represented. It's a very dangerous move because they are Mitchelton Scott and the Quartermantha Real Estate National Team are represented there. They are arguably two of the strongest teams. If they're represented in the break, there's nobody left to chase. They're not letting them get too far. The other teams need to really pay attention now. Chloe Hosking will be just holding a good wheel and hoping that somebody else chases. She does have four, five good, strong teammates to pull it back if needed. And no sprint. Well, Jackson oh, wants the is. points. Jackson, she opens up. She's looking for the three points and she collects them in the race for the map by sprint classification. So that puts her into equal first position with Whitehouse, who was in the breakaway and won the sprint into Torquay. And it's Sarah Roy that comes through second. Lauren Kitchen in third. After an intermediate sprint, it's a very, very dangerous time because riders often take that opportunity to make the attack and make the move. Sarah Roy has chosen to force the pace, but with the peloton right on the tail, she's sat up. A little bit of cat and mouse beginning to be played, Phil. Lauren Kitchen patrolling the front, looking to her left, looking to her right. Well, Shannon Molseed. She better look to her right right now because that's the champion of Australia joining the front. And she's just gone to the back wheel uh, of Hammers of Germany. Spratt has oh, attacked Spratt again well. at the front. And also Rachel Nalen in second position. 
the winner of the inaugural edition of the Deakin University Cadell Evans Great Ocean Road Race. These are, the these are the leg breakers now because they are only a few kilometres from the start of the climb. And the strong ones will keep the pressure on. Still a very big peloton. Van Vluten, number one, trying to move up the right-hand side in the gutter, but it's a relatively safe gutter. It's a very new one. Oh, a little bit of a dab, almost losing the handlebars, hitting one of the cat's eyes on the road there for the Kiwi. There's Cardinia Park off in the distance, Carayo Bay, the destination, the finish line in Geelong. It's a bit of a section of recovery as they scoop down in toward town. The peloton is very reduced. Uh, we haven't necessarily seen the riders dropping off the back, but from that aerial shot and that front shot, we can see that it is reduced. The Mapai sprint, we didn't know if it would be contested. And it was Jackson who got the three points. Sarah Roy collecting two points and then Audrey Cordon collecting the one point. Now the top three place getters for the second of the intermediate sprints. The Quartermint, the Real Estate National, Australian National Team are all grouping just to the right of picture there, starting to come to the front. Tiffany Cromwell, that's Peter Mullins uh, that is on the front there. Tiffany Cromwell as road captain is instructing. I've seen her, you know, pat the girls on the back a bit, push them up. She's in second wheel there. Loretta Hansen sitting in third with Lauren Kitchen in fourth. They've got Catherine Garfield, of course, as one of the race favourites that they are looking after. Catherine Garfield, we can just see her on the left of screen in the yellow helmet, similar to the Mitchelton Scott team she was of course formerly of that team this is a cavalry charge to the start of the climb now and Garford is being brought there to spring away from behind her teammates and that's going to increase her favorite ranking right now she's in a perfect position here in previous editions of the race at this point they would have been making the left hand turn to take the shortcut over the climb the backside of Chalamba Crescent this time around they're heading further into Geelong before they eventually make a left hand turn to go up the climb that we saw as part of the world championships in 2010 and it is brutally steep at the top it's going to prove decisive I think we'll get the strong women away at least I don't think the sprinters will survive this one but they still have a chance if they don't lose too much ground to get back before the finish. At the moment, the pace being set by Loretta Hansen. And it's the uh, quarter the real estate team oh, with four uh, riders at the Peter front. Mullins now, They've yeah. got Mullins. Hansen is there, so too Cromwell. And in fourth position is Garfoot. Behind her is Chloe Hosking. And now we're seeing Lauren Kitchen move around the outside. Gracie Elvin, number four. They know the battle that is about to commence on the climb. And it's the quarter the real estate team who are taking full responsibility for the race. Well, it's theirs to lose. We knew Chloe Hosking. We know that this will be a challenging course for her, but her position it indicates that she's confident it indicates yeah. that she's got good legs she's got prime position up there her teammates they're coming and going uh, depending on how the course is turning up and down at the moment they're sweeping down back into town not so much a section of recovery though because the quarter Mentha real estate national team are doing an exceptionally good job of keeping the peloton strung out they're in a lot of control Mitchelton Scott we don't have a lot of the riders together Annemiek van Vloten in the middle of the field there she needs to start moving up. She needs to grab a teammate. She's got Georgia Williams there in the national champions colours of New Zealand. Amanda Spratt moving up on the right-hand side. Well, well, look, they're almost on the climb. Once it starts, it'll be an explosion. That was number two, Amanda Spratt, moving around the outside. In the green colours with number 12 was Anuska Costa, who's a former Dutch national champion. This is the left-hand turn. They're getting very close towards the climb now, Phil. And as they line up for this climb now, expect catching Garford to try and go from the lower slopes to get a gap that she can hold for the next nine kilometres to the finish. But I think you're right, Chloe Hoskin believes in herself today. She was fourth in this race last year, but of course, it didn't come quite the same way in to the finish. Job done for Tiff Cromwell. Swings off, gets out of the way. She's given the instructions. She's done the job. It's up to the rest of them to finish it off. We just saw Shannon Molsey back toward the end of the peloton. That's not a good place for her to be. She really, really needs to move up. She's got the legs to do it. Loretta Hanson doing a very big job for Katrin Garfoot. Lauren Kitchen sitting on a wheel. Chloe Hosking tucked in. And that's Gracie Elvin just behind Hosking. 
They are lining up for the base of the climb. This is Loretta Hansen who's setting the tempo. She's a good sprinter. She knows the climb is not for her. She's spending everything to get to the bottom, to make it hard, to soften the legs for the rivals of Katrin Garfoot, because Garfoot on this climb will go. If anybody ever had any doubt that this was a team sport, Phil, this is the perfect example of how a team can win or lose you a race. Well, the team has given Katrin Garford a perfect lead to the mountain. Now, can she crack it? Robbie, you're down in amongst it. Katrin Garford, how does she look? She looks incredible at the moment. Now she's just on the front. That was like watching a sprint lead out coming onto the bottom of the climb. But Garfoot is now on the front, kitchen just behind her. But last night I was speaking to the team director from the quarter the team. They said, Katrin Garfoot will go all the way up the climb. She's about to take the turn onto the steepest part. She's looking incredibly comfortable. And I see pain on a lot of faces in what is left of the peloton. It is splitting to pieces after about 15th wheel Garfoot on the front out of the saddle and riders are starting to pull out left and right and be dropped and they're starting to really whittle down Chloe Hosking still there in fourth wheel fifth wheel starting to be in difficulty Van Vluten coming to the front now and it's an attack from one of the riders from Wow Deals and to me that looks like it's Sabrina Stilchens it is the Dutch girl the Dutch girl it is too and what a powerful attack her teammates have been saying all morning she's our woman she's the one who's going to tear this thing apart and she looks incredible she's been waiting patiently they're getting towards the steep part of the climb and now she is going well we're watching and trying to get on turns molly weaver of great britain here uh, sorry like Rob, jackson Rob, by the no, looks of it me. allison jackson is the canadian rather than the silicon uh, bank tipco team and she's coming up. Jackson, who is fighting Garfoot. Not what you would say in the distance, but she is fighting to hold on. This is a brilliant performance by the Dutch woman at the front. Well, she won one of the QOMs over at the Tour Down Under. We know that she can climb. She fell ill after that and couldn't complete the race. She was very disappointed, but we know that she can climb. This isn't unexpected. But what we need to see from Garfoot, from Hosking, from any of the Mitchelton Scott riders, they just need to be within sniffing distance. When they go over the top of the climb, they've still got nine kilometres left to race. If they can still just just see just ahead that break i believe it can come back together katrin garfoot bridging uh, across now number one hanamik van vloten suffering a little bit behind katrin garfoot but still in contention look how comfortable stolchens looks she's really climbing above and beyond this is a bit of a surprise perhaps for katrin but she looks very composed van vloten in a bit of trouble garfoot is now coming she's making the most of the rapid tempo that has been set on this climb but Stoulton's, she does look composed. The Dutch woman in green is yet to win a professional race. She's had a second. She was eighth in the Route de France, and she is in a good position at the moment, trying to stick with Garfoot, who is opening up the throttle. Garfoot has got to get some sort of a lead now. She's a great time trialist. She's the world champion if she can just hold it to the line. But these other three are fighters. Jackson's the surprise. She's looked absolutely shattered on the far right. And Van Vluten has slipped on the far left here. She knows over the top of this climb, still in contention with Garfoot, she will win the day. That is the top. Garfoot goes over the top first. So she gets the points in the race for the Subaru Queen of the Mountains, but Garfoot Kate, she looks so strong. Incredibly impressive climb up there. She started a little bit back, but she clawed her way and then accelerated it's straight past. It's not enough, past. Kate. It's not enough. These three will come back together, whether it's three, whether it's more. It'll come back together. It's still playing well into Garfoot's hands. What she does know now, Phil, is that she's stronger than Van Vloten. She's in better shape and better condition. And Van Vloten is going to have to work very hard in the threesome. If they're going to come together to the line, there'll be a strong chase behind. Nine kilometres, it can be a long way back. She was stronger than Van Vloten on the climb. It's a different matter now. She's over the climb. And I think you'll find Annemiek will be stronger than Katrin. And what about Stilchens, the Dutch woman? She's really climbed so well, and I've never heard of her. <laughs> well, there's one more climb to come. She, here she is. She's 24 years of age. In November, she was across in Western Australia, spent some time at the Tour of Margaret River. That was a key part of her preparation for the season. 
and she is part of this team at the request of Mariana Voss, the great Dutch woman who was one of the all-time greats of cycling, right in the conversation with the likes of Eddie Merckx and Bernard Hinault. She chose Stoltens to be on this team. Well, that was a very good choice by Mariana, without doubt has, was and uh, is one of the greatest Dutch cyclists who have ever turned a pedal. These three now, three big names it seems, but uh, Van Vluten is in prime position in the middle. Stilchen's done what she wants to do, at least Van Vluten and Stilchen's can talk together, but they're on rival teams, don't forget. New team this year for number 14. Last year she was with the Sunweb squad, this time around it's with Wal Deals in the green colours. Quickly down here, across a very narrow bridge, and then one more steep climb. And Garford's got to go there. She's got to go on the climb. Well, none of them are noted sprinters. No. But none of them are particularly slow either. Van Vluten, she knows the strength of Garford. Number one is not working. She is waiting for this climb in the hope she can survive. Or jump away. And we know how tough she is. She's ditched the last bid, 7.4 kilometres to go. No more water required, and she's wary I think of her she compatriot. Knows she knows, obviously, she should do. But this is not a fast push, and we can't see behind just now. There might well be a reaction from the field soon. No Mitchell and Scott to chase, of course. And no Cordamenta Australian team to chase. There's the single lane bridge down there, which was uh, altered for the route of the championships back in 2010. And there goes Van Bluten going over the top as they hit the base of the climb. A few hundred metres up this climb, they make a left-hand turn, and that's where it gets really steep. And this is an this opportunity one. for Garfoot. Quickly into the small chain ring for Garfoot. She knows the course. Van Bluten has done the same. And now so too does Sabrina Stultens. Here comes the left-hand turn. Katrin Garfoot, one of the big pre-race favourites. So too, number one last year's winner, Annemiek van Vluten. But Sabrina Stultens could be the one to cause the big surprise. Last time I saw Sabrina Stultens. Robbie, you're down with the three leaders. Your final thoughts. Well, I'm having a look at all three, and Garfoot, she's doing all the work. Van Vluten looks to be labouring a little bit, head up, head down, rocking and rolling on over the bike. They're coming now onto the steepest section of this little uphill. It is about 16%, and Garfoot is making another acceleration, and the gap's just starting to maybe open Van Vluten. She's literally turning herself inside out to stay on the wheel. It's Garfoot putting on all the pressure, and Stilchens, she looks very comfortable with it, and even though she looks uncomfortable from blurt and she's made it over this hardest part of the climb from here it's flat and downhill all the way to the finish it'll be more of a tactical battle and then who has the fastest legs in the sprint phil do they come any tougher than number one anemic van bluten and she's probably reminding herself right now i'm the number one they can't drop me and she's hanging in because if she comes over these hills are still in touch believe me she'll go for them I actually remember commentating on Stilchens back in 2015 now, Matt, I just remembered. She was second in a race in Johannesburg in South Africa when she was 21 years of age. It's known as the 94.7, it's now called the 947. Here's the remnants of the peloton. There's the LA Cipollini colours. Chloe Hosking riding towards the front. Rachel Nalen is there as well. She's a teammate of Katrin Garford, who was off the front. Amanda Spratt, number two, is also in that very select group. That looks like Shannon Molseed, the Australian national champion, at the rear of the group. Here are the leaders, and they're leaving all the work up to 131, Katrin Garford. They've no choice. I don't think they can help her just now, and she feels this might be the winning move, but, you know, there are 15 women in that chase group. Stiltons. Yep, yeah, Stiltons is gone. She sensed the slowing down, and that's a terrific acceleration. Trying to make the most of the little game of cat and mouse between these two former teammates. Well, that's the way to do it. Two favourites won't help each other. This could be the winning move. It could be the winning move. Six kilometres out from home. And look at the gap that has quickly opened up. Garfoot looks into the eyes of Van Vluten. She's now on to race radio, speaking with the team car, seeking instructions. And Van Vluten is not moving. And Stilchens has never, ever won a professional race. 
and if they don't react very quickly, she's going to win this one. She's had two second place finishes throughout her career so far. She's 5.5 kilometres away from her first win. And what would it mean to her in her first big international race with her new team up against the great Dutch woman, Annemiek van Vluten, the world's number one. There she is, number 14 from the Well Deals team. Last year, she rode with the Sunweb squad, just one season with that team. You know, uh, uh, as we said right at the top of the commentary, this team is trained and looked after by Jerome Blyladens, a four-time stage winner in the Tour de France and a great sprinter. And he's put all his knowledge into this squad by the look of it now. Sabrina Stulchens out on the attack on her own. Who is going to chase her? Who can chase her? There's two of the favourites behind her. They won't attack each other. They won't work with each other, rather, and there are 15 in the peloton back of those two. Eight seconds is her advantage to the two chasers. 30 seconds to the peloton. Wow. Deals. <laughs> Indeed. And what is it about eight seconds in close bike races? Uh, yes, 1989, Tour de France, Greg LeMond and Laurent Fignon. It looks like the two chasers are now starting to work together. Garfoot and Van Vluten have recognised if they don't collaborate, they're racing for second. I think they are racing for second right now. I think the peloton will come back up to them. Although the chief referee's car is still in there with Wayne Pompey and Pomeroy, Pomeroy in there. That's the first look over the shoulder that we've seen from Sabrina Stultons since she's gone off the front. Normally the look across the shoulder is a little bit of concern at sore legs. On that occasion, I don't believe it was. That was a quick assessment. The 24-year-old has a birthday during the Tour de France in the month of July. She's made the move. She's got to complete it now. She's totally committed. She's inside four kilometres to go. The road continually switches direction. That's good for the breakaway. These two are not working. Van Vluten's well, had to go to the front now. I think they are now. Van Vluten has recognised if she doesn't contribute with Garfoot, the race is all over. So number one, Van Vluten. Number one, three, one, that is Garfoot. Two big pre-race favourites. And Stultens was barely mentioned. She's the one to catch. Well, that's because we've never heard of her, really, as a, as a top performer, but she's so young. Now we've all heard of her. The big teams will be looking to sign her up, possibly, as the season unwinds. Very, very strong woman. Showed us she can climb on steep climbs as well. The long straight road, that gives her nowhere to hide. Almost inside the last three kilometres. It's going to be a long 3K, Matt. But most of it is ever so slightly downhill, which is to her advantage. Well, she's been up amongst it in some of the biggest races in the world, like 11th in the Tour of Italy, at a stage race, of course. One-day races are so much different. It's consistency in the multi-day races, it's strength and ambition and success in the one-day races. And when she was 11th in that Tour of Italy, it was number one who's chasing her, Annemiek van Vluten, who was the winner. So the young Dutch woman clearly not intimidated by the world number one. In fact, she's attacked her. The pan back. Well, that's, that's a big gap. That's enough. There's the 15 chase. Oh, swelled a little bit since, so they've slowed down. Or people have got back on over the hill. It's a much bigger bunch now. Maybe 20 riders down there. Where's the two chases? There they are. That's the lead. I think they've picked up the two chases. In fact, the chasers have been caught by the peloton, and now it's Stultons, who's the only sole survivor, with two and a half kilometres remaining. The last time check we had was 30 seconds. It looks much closer than that now, but it is still doable. This is a brave move. Well, she cannot afford to look round anymore now. She either wins or she finishes last. It's as simple as that. And this is, I remember Cadell Evans coming down here in the World Championship Road Race back in 2010. He was the defending world champion on that occasion. She goes over this bridge, which must seem like a mountain now. Over the railway tracks, they can see her, but can they organise themselves to bring her back? 12 seconds is her advantage. In fact, it looks like it's a lot less than that. This could turn out to be a bunch sprint finish of 20 or so riders. Grace Brown is still in that chasing it's Six group. seconds. I've just timed it. Six seconds the gap. Six seconds. 
They're about to hit the right-hand turn across the roundabout, and then it's along the Esplanade with Carayo Bay on the left-hand side. The finish line awaits. It's not a done deal, <laughs> but once she swings onto the promenade, she'll have a little incentive. Amanda Spratt is at the front. She's doing the chasing. That's Spratt with the close down, followed by Lauren Kitchen, then Van Vluten, Grace Brown is there. I'll tell you now, Kate's, Kate's selection of Chloe Hosking is looking rather good. Well, where is she? She's in there. Looking to try and locate Chloe Hosking. You can see the LA Cipollini colours, the very bright colours, off to the right-hand side of the peloton. Anushka is still in there as well. Anushka Costa, the former Dutch champion, with her teammate still off the front. It is Spratt who's doing the chasing. Oh, and at one and a half kilometres to go, she's going to see the one kilometre kite imminently, but the charge is on, and Spratt is bringing Mitchelton Scott back into the thick of it. Now the catch is on. Stultons has been caught. Shannon Molseed is still there. And number 31, Chloe Hosking, and she's got Costa just behind her. Rachel Nalen moving around the outside. And Georgia Bronzini in the black colours, number 42, is also ah, in contention. She's locked onto the wheel of Chloe Hoskins, the two-time world champion, picking up Chloe Hoskins. Hoskins... ...could go down to the same again here. This is Amanda Spratt now coming forward. The look across the shoulder. Number four is Gracie Alvin. That's who Spratt is trying to lead out. It's now Chloe Hosking in a third position. Lauren Kitchen is on her wheel. Anushka Costa is in the mix. Hosking number 31, she survived the climbs. Katrin Garford is also there. The Australian champion, Shannon Molseed, she's moving around the outside. She's got Jackson on her wheel. Audrey Cordon is also there. This is Spratt on the front. Alvin is waiting. So too is Chloe Hosking. Molsi trying to open up the sprint. Oh, Cordon is going. Cordon is trying to run for the line. It is Hosking that's desperately trying to get her nose in front. It's Chloe Hosking sprinting for victory. Bronzini is challenging, but it is Chloe Hosking who celebrates. Hosking gets the line. Gracie Elvin will have crossed her in second place. And that was an unfortunate crash right at the moment of impact for Chloe Hosking. She got that one dead right. Well done, Kate Bates. She named him well out. Chloe Hosking from Gracie Alvin, Georgia Bronzini rounding out the podium in third. There she is, all smiles. Never underestimate Chloe Hosking when her finish line is within sight. She's been in the top five before. Now she's on the top step of the podium. Yes, she was fourth last year in this event. She's gone right to the top. Chain problem? And just across the finish line, the <laughs> chain has slipped off and is locked. But it doesn't matter now. She is the winner. Well, that was a very, very good last 10 kilometres of racing. Sabrina Stulchens did so well, she did her best, and she almost read it absolutely right. The other two stars, Catherine Garford and the Van Vliet, tried their best, but in the end, they didn't have what it took. Hoskins took a gamble, waited, and won. Former winner Rachel Nalen congratulating this year's winner, Chloe Hosking. There's Lauren Kitchen. Our race winner is down with Robbie McEwen. Well, guys, Chloe is just going to have a bit of a run around to the teammates. We're going to follow her just to get some of that action. I think my camera's straight a bit further away, but Chloe, pretty excited getting through with the win. Did you feel at some time it was not going to happen anymore when, when those three were in front? To be honest, I didn't know they were there. <laughs> That's what happens when you're struggling on the back of a climb. Um, I thought we caught the Tibco girl, and I thought that was it. Um, and then I heard some people on the hill saying that... 25 seconds or something in front and um yeah i'd actually watched the 2010 worlds i knew that it could come back over the climb and you know i was pretty adamant in the team meeting last night if i get over the climb i'm gonna win <laughs> my team director didn't think i'd get over the climb so i asked first thing i where's my apology <laughs> um,
Um, no, but I, I've been targeting this race since November. So it's the first race I've targeted and won, which I'm super stoked about. And it means a lot for my coach and I. So, yeah, really happy. It was a fantastic win. Tell us something about the sprint. Coming in that last couple of hundred metres, knowing you're in it to win it and getting everything just right. What was going through your head coming into that? Yeah, I was really nervous I'd get jumped from behind because it's such a fast finish. So I think I went with 300 to go, but I knew that it was fast. And so often if I jump first, they can't come over me. So I just put my head down and I sort of tried to channel Caleb Ewan, got so low. And then I think I won by a fair bit, so. <laughs> you did. How much of a huge confidence booster is this going into the rest of the season, finishing off the Aussie season like this? Yeah, I mean, it, it is huge and it's really just a reward. You know, I worked really hard over the off season to get on top of things that I know were weaknesses. So, you know, I know I'm not there yet, but um, it's just a nice stepping stone to show that I'm going in the right direction. Well, Matt and Phil, you heard it. Chloe says she's not there yet, but pretty impressive. Back over to you. Well, the rest of the professional peloton should be really nervous if that's Chloe Hosking. Not there yet. Her ability to survive the climb and defy the lack of belief from the team sports director. I think she's got a great deal of confidence in her own ability and she always did what she knew she could do best. That was mark the race. She knew she had no chance on the climb. She limited her efforts and once over that climb, she got herself back into the race. She knew if she came down to the finish in a group, she would win the sprint. And she never panicked. There That's was the big thing. There was nothing she could do about those climbers. She stuck with the peloton, just backed herself and waited patiently. A brilliant yeah. ride. Let's not forget the performance by Sabrina Stultons, caught with just on one kilometre to go. That was an outstanding performance by the young Dutchwoman. Yes, it was. I think we'll be talking about her in the future. She will take a lot of confidence from that. I mean, just a moment's hesitation by the chase, and she would have stayed away to the victory that. And the tactical nature of the sport, you can't help but wonder what would have happened if those three leaders, along with Stultons, Garfoot, and Van Vluten, if they had have stuck together, they might have survived, but they didn't. And it came down to this sprint finish, and Chloe Hosking, she'd marked Gracie Elvin. She knew the lead out from Mitchelton Scott. Here's a look at the fall as well on the right-hand side. And that looks like it was Jackson that went down heavily from the Tibco team. And she opened up, and she was never really challenged, was she? No, this is as she won similarly in Adelaide as well this was our last win and our first win of the year this is her second and she's very fast if you give her the chance to wind that sprint up there's not many people can beat her anywhere in the world gracie elvin in second position and adding to the prestige of the victory in third place georgia bronzini let's head back down to robbie McEwen. i'm here with gracie elvin second place Gracie, your team threw absolutely everything at the race, and at the end, it looked like you could have had it won with Annemiek van Vleuten. Everything came back, and then it was over to you. Yeah, no, it's one of those races where anything can happen, and in previous years, it's been a small group or solo, so it was looking like that today, but I think with that, the Shalamba climb and the heat, uh, it really made a big difference to the bunch today. And um, yeah, I was just trying to save it all for that sprint just in case. And uh, Spratty and Anamik looked after me in the last couple of K and then Spratty did a super good long lead out for me. And uh, Chloe just got the jump on me and she's arguably the world's best sprinter. So I'm really happy to get second. It was a fantastic sprint that you did and in front of Georgia Bronzini, former world champion. So all day long, the team was saying to you, take it easy, just put everything on the sprint. Don't try and make any attacks or go in breaks. Um, we were trying to play it by ear, like if I saw a good opportunity, I would have tried to attack, but I guess it was all down to that, that big climb, so I just needed to save it for that. And the wind wasn't in our favour today, there was a, quite a lot of headwind coming back into town, so it was easy to waste energy. So yeah, I'm just happy to make it to the finish today, because my form's still coming up for the classics that I'm really excited about. And we saw it was a, quite a hectic finish as well, were you aware of the big crash that happened in the sprint itself? I heard it. It's probably the most awful sound you can hear as a bike rider, but that was just as we were jumping for the sprint, so I, I, I'm happy I didn't see it. <laughs> well, excellent second place. Congratulations and, and enjoy the podium celebrations. Thanks, Robbie. Back to you guys. Certainly on target. Certainly on target for a good season once again, Gracie Elvin. Second position, never really challenged Chloe Hosking, who's much more a pure sprinter than Gracie. But Gracie can take, like Chloe, a lot of confidence out of this result for the season that lies ahead.
I think this will be a terrific boost for her now. She rides for the Italian Ale Cipollini uh, team, and Cipollini, of course, was one of the greatest sprinters ever and holds the record for sprint wins in the Giro d'Italia. I think it's 40, might be more than that. There's the results for you confirmed. Chloe Hoskins wins. Not a fast time, really. Three hours, 15 minutes today. Gracie Elvin in second place, all given the same time as they would be in the sprint. Georgina Bronzini continues her love affair with Geelong. She's been the world champion here. She finishes third here now. Cordona was in fourth position. The Polish national champion, Polwozka, rounds out the top five. It was then Lauren Kitchen in sixth place. Let's head back down once again to Robbie McEwen. I have the third place getter, Georgia Bronzini, former world champion. Georgia, did you expect at the start of the day that you'd be sprinting for the win on this tough circuit? No, I didn't think about this. Uh, I expect uh, more hard course, maybe from uh, halfway to the end uh, by the main team, uh, Milchenton and uh, Australia. But I think they would pretty look each other. And they attacked that just in the second last climb. Uh, it was already enough to split uh, the bunch and make it like a bomb exploding. I was a bit behind and I hang up and and I had a mate, uh, Rossella Ratto, that uh, take me safe in the last, uh, in the last uh, piece of the race. So I'm just sad uh, in this Australian period, I just got a podium and a bit uh, disappointed, but also happy because I always behind Aussie and it's Aussie season, so I must be happy. But it also says a lot about the, the level of women cycling across the board, that there are so many riders capable of winning the big races. It must be very proud for you to have been associated with that and been one of the ones at the forefront of pushing women cycling to this new level. Well, obviously, for me, it's even harder, but I'm really, really happy that uh, women cycling is really in developing a, in a good and fast mood. So I'm going to cheer for all the young uh, coming stronger. Just take us through the final couple of hundred metres in the sprint. Your position, were you happy with where you started from? Tell us your perspective. Uh, well, I fight a bit to have a Chloe's wheel because I realised that was a faster in the little bunch, but was a bit too hectic and in fact there was a crash, which uh, I was able to don't be involved in, and so I was a bit too much behind. But I think anyway, I think Chloe today had the best leg, so I think uh, she deserves a win. It's a very fine third place, even if it's not a win, so congratulations. Thank you so much. Georgia Bronzini, the dual world champion, she oozes class. A little disappointed with third, but acknowledging it was the woman with the best legs that won, and full credit given to Chloe Hoskin. She was faster than anybody. She was gaining distance all the way to the line. If we'd have gone another 10 metres, she'd have won by a further five. There's the boys who brought us the pictures, by the way, Matt, and what a great job those guys do. The camera underneath the helicopter there. Brilliant images today. Perfect. Stunning backdrop. Geelong, the surf coast. It's been showing off the Great Ocean Road, the fourth edition of the Deakin University, Cat Levin's Great Ocean Road race. The yachts all ported here in Carayo Bay. The Ferris wheel, which gets regular use, particularly throughout the summer months. Cardinia Park, you can see the towers, the light towers off in the distance, the home of the Geelong Football Club in the Australian Football League. Just back to Georgia Bronzini, eight years ago that she won the world title here in Geelong, Time and flies. she's still right at the top of the peloton. She is, but she's heading up to 40 years of age now, so one or two more years she'll probably have to come off at this level of competition, uh, but she's such an ambassador for the sport, and she's, she's been twice the world champion as well. Tomorrow we'll see the fourth edition of the men's race and Australia is still searching for a winner. Thus far it's been the greats of international cycling who have won. Each time at the start of the race, Cadell Evans, he rolls out with a few of the juniors. And in the past few years, we've seen lots of attacks early on in the piece. Last year, it was Connor Dunn from the Aqua Blue team, who was really aggressive early. And in the sprint to the line, Cameron Meyer got caught in the dying metres, and it was Nikki's aunt who took the win. Simon Gerrans was in second place. Nikkius is back to defend his title. And Simon Gerrans twice second in this race. A new team this year. He's riding for BMC alongside the likes of Richie Port and also Rowan Dennis. And Simon Gerrans, he'd dearly love to win, wouldn't he, Phil? Yes, he most certainly would. He's on a new team, of course. Let's have a look at the highlights of the day. We've got underway Scott Sunderland waving the flag. 
a gentle start simply because there was no wind and then came the first attack 10 kilometers in uh, by Mozenti. And Mozenti was very active that was on the road towards Bowen Heads a heavy fall the most seriously injured was the rider in the very bright colours. That was Roxanne Kinnaderman. She's gone off to hospital just for a checkup. We then saw the attack from the Sydney Uni Staminate team, and it was at Georgia Whitehouse that went on the move. Another fall. Whitehouse had a few mechanical problems heading towards Torquay. She was then caught by the Italian at Morzenti. They got together and they worked well for quite some time. It took a while to get Whitehouse back on the road. But the peloton never saw her. She managed to catch up again with Mozenti. They got together now, hoping to stay out there all the way to the finish. The maximum lead they ever attained, about 3 minutes 20. This was the sprint in Torquay for the Mapai sprint classification, and it was bizarre to stay the least. They almost came to a standstill, and it was Whitehouse who got the points. Huge crowds on the side of the road in Torquay. Lovely to see such big crowds, and the men will see those same crowds on Sunday, then came the Queen of the Mountains, 100 metres from the top, White House again, stealing the points. That was for the Subaru, Queen of the Mountains classification. The competition that today has been taken out by Katrin Garfoot as a result of leading over the top of Chalamba Crescent. The two breakaway riders, they were caught with just on 30 kilometres still to race. And then we saw the action start to heat up with Mitchelton Scott, the first to really initiate the move in what little crosswind there was. Number one, the defending champion, Annemiek Van Vluten, wherever she went, number 131, Katrin Garfoot also went. Yes, but this was an important leading group of four here, as they now looked as though things were going to smarten up just that little bit. This was under the climb. Garfoot leading over the top of Chalambra. It was Thornton's in second position, followed then by Van Vluten, as Jackson was just losing contact. All three were together on the final climb of the day, and Garfoot couldn't quite break them. No, that gentle pace all the way around the course by the peloton. There was too many fresh legs on that climb. Garfoot put all her eggs in that basket, and it didn't work. But then came the surprise. Sabrina Sulchins put in an attack that looked good enough to win the day. For a while, it did look as if she was a chance to be able to hold them off. Van Vluten and Garfoot, they were caught by the peloton. And then the chase was on in earnest with Amanda Spratt doing the lead out. A fall with Jackson in the dash for the line as Chloe Hosking came home the winner. Increasing a lead all of the way to line. Chased home by Gracie Elvin of Mitchell and Scott and the, the work former world champion Bronzini in third. All smiles for Chloe Hosking going out the winner of the Deakin University Kid Elevens Great Ocean Road Race. The sailing continues out on Carayo Bay. Such a calm, beautiful day. And tomorrow we look forward to the men's race where the weather again is expected to play a part, but in a different form to what it did today. The part it played today was that it was so calm, so it nullified some of the action. Tomorrow, the heat, it's expected to be up towards 39 degrees. It is, and uh, rather hoping the wind does raise itself just a little bit. You can't see it, but there are little men behind those boats pushing them because there's no wind at all in the bay today. Now it looks very calm, beautiful for the tourists. What a wonderful spot it is here in Geelong. Around about a one-hour drive to the south of Melbourne. The gateway then through onto the Great Ocean Road, one of the most spectacular coastlines anywhere in the world. And here is Geelong off in the distance. No better way to show your state and your town than a bike race because we get into places other things can't reach. But Hoskin today has triumphed for Australia, leaving uh, Van, Vloot. Van Vluten as the only non-Australian in four years to win this event, which he did back in 2016. Meanwhile, in the men's race, we're yet to see an Australian win the race. That's a very good point. It might all change tomorrow. You never know. The final kilometre of the race today was really frantic as we saw Sabrina Stultons from the Well Deals team. She just got reeled back in outside that one kilometre mark. And then you heard from Georgia Bronzini in that interview with Robbie McEwen that it was frantic. It was difficult to find that right position. And she was really fighting for the wheel to try and get herself behind Chloe Hosking as Bronzini. She marked Chloe Hosking as certainly one of the riders to beat. Gracie Alvin, she had to take up the responsibility for the Mitchelton-Scott team after 
they saw that last year's winner, Annemiek van Vluten, was caught. Here's a look at that approach towards the finish line. The right-hand turn onto the Esplanade. It was Stultons still off the front on her own with Amanda Spratt trying to close things down. And this really showed the maturity of Amanda Spratt, a woman who's won here before, recognising that she wasn't the quickest option for Mitchelton Scott, so she really sacrificed herself. Sabrina Stultons, the Dutch woman out in front. She tried her luck. She just ran out of horsepower towards the end. The 24-year-old still searching for her first professional victory. She's had a couple of second-place finishes, but surely that first big win isn't too far away. And it was at this point where you could see the bright colours of Chloe Hosking. Number 31, she was in the ideal spot, directly behind number four, Gracie Elvin, and others were fighting for her wheel. Number 42 in the black colours, Georgia Bronzini, the former world champion, trying to get herself behind Chloe Hosking. Anushka Costa also trying to do the same thing. Rachel Nalen getting involved in the lead out, trying to protect the position of Lauren Kitchen. Kitchen, number 133, she ended up finishing in sixth place. And now the lead out was really on Spratt at the front. Gracie Alvin having to close that gap ever so slightly as Garfoot was also trying to stay up there in the mix. A bit of pushing and shoving, trying to get onto the wheel of Chloe Hosking. The Australian champion off to the left, Shannon Molseed, inside that final kilometre, spending a bit of energy and looking for Alison Jackson to try and do the lead out. There's Jackson, number 55 in the black colours, behind Shannon Molseed as Alvin at this point was just waiting to open up the sprint. And Chloe Hosking, a little boxed in, but not panicking. A little flick of the elbow. There's the fall with Jackson and Chloe Hosking opening up the sprint. And from that moment on, she was never really challenged. Number 25, Audrey Cordon, the French woman, fading the last few hundred metres. Alvin, it was in second place with Georgia Bronzini rounding out the podium. And let's now head down to the presentation with Kate Bates. Ladies and gentlemen, what an afternoon of racing it has been for the Deakin University Elite Women's Road Race here in Geelong. This one-day classic is not an easy course, with the Chalambra adding some extra twists and some turns at the end. But these 15 women's teams, they certainly put a show on here today with some spectacular racing. From an early breakaway with Australian Georgia Whitehouse and Italian Lisa Morzenti to a large, last charge up the climb by Katrin Garfoot, we certainly saw some animated racing and a deserved winner. Now it's time to present the awards for the UCI World Tour event, the Deakin University Elite Women's Road Race. To present the third place for today's Deakin University Elite Women's Road Race, please welcome Surf Coast Shire Councillor Margot Smith. And the winner is Georgia Bronzini from Silence Pro Cycling. Thank you, Margot, and to our third place, Georgia Bronzini. Mm -hmm. to, to present, present the, the second, second place, place for today's, today's Deakin University, University Elite Women's, Women's, Women's Road Race, Race. Please welcome Management Committee, Union Cyclist International and President, UCI Global Women's Commission, Tracy Gaudry. And our second place winner is Gracie Elvin, Mitchelton Scott. Thank you, Tracy, and to our second place, Gracie Elvin. And our overall winner, to present the winner of the Deakin University Elite Women's Road Race, please welcome local member for Geelong, Christine Cousins, MP. The winner of the 2011 Tour de France, he needs no introduction, Australia's own Cadell Evans. And Vice-Chancellor from the Deakin University, Professor Jane Den Hollander.
And as part of the gifts associated with the winner today, Tag Hoyer are presenting a Tag Hoyer Connected Modular 45 watch. And the winner is Chloe Hosking, Ale Cipollini. Thank you, Christine, Jane, and indeed our very own Cadell Evans. Ladies and gentlemen, your top three from today, Georgia Bronzini, Gracie Elvin, and Chloe Hosking. Chloe Hosking going out the winner, taking the famous trophy, which is the wave for the Deakin University Cadell Evans Great Ocean Road Race and her moment in the sun. A deserved winner after what was a dramatic race. Tomorrow we'll have the men to see whether an Australian can join the honour roll because up until now it's been the internationals who have taken out the race. But today it is Chloe Hosking who shines in the sun the brightest. The sprinter who many doubted would be able to make it over the climb, she defied the odds she made it over the top and she won comfortably. On behalf of Kate Bates, Robbie McEwen and Phil Liggett, Matthew Kane saying goodbye for now. We'll see you tomorrow for more from the Cadell Evans Great Ocean Road Race.